getting all set. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Welcome to the Ocean Observing Co-Design Workshop. We welcome everyone from across the world uh, to join us here. There are uh, several of us here in New York City participating in a UN uh, discussion this week about the ocean observing. So this is very timely. We have a team of uh, five people here and a lot more uh, preparing for the workshop this week. So welcome. My name is David Legler. I'm uh, from NOAA. That's uh, what I do during the day. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my uh, co-chair. I'm Sabrina Speich. I'm uh, working in France in uh, IPSL and uh, I'm uh, OPC co-chair and uh, welcome to today. And we have uh, all the uh, ocean program uh, here around uh, between here and uh, across the world. And thank you for coming uh, to this workshop. So let's get on with our program. So first of all, we'll, uh, I'd like to welcome Raid, uh, who's going to speak to us a little bit about our logistics and preparation for the meeting today. So Maureen, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, this is just a note to remind you, please, to interact on Slack. Um, so everybody who is registered will have received an email with an invitation to Slack. We encourage you to um, interact through the day one chat channel. And there are also different channels set up for the different exemplar areas. Um, if you haven't linked in on chat yet or on Slack yet, we can send you a link to join. Um, but we ask you to please keep the, the webinar chat for, for technical help um, only and keep the um, co-design themed discussion mostly to Slack. And just another reminder that this session is being recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. So let's go on with the next slide and we'll talk about our uh, agenda for today. So we're first gonna have some introductory talks to stimulate us and get us all acquainted with the Ocean Observing Co-Design Program and its concepts. Um, then we're gonna talk about uh, looking past, uh, looking at our lessons learned from some of our regional observing system efforts and some re more recent co-design successes. Uh, then we're gonna take a short break uh, and then we're going to uh, have a, a further discussion around uh, what it means to uh, around these exemplars and, and talk more about stakeholder engagement and learning again from other, other best practices and examples. And so at the end of the day, we'll have a short discussion and we'll, uh, we'll be using the Slack channel a lot during that last session as it's intended to be a discussion to hear your views and to get your input as part of our proceedings for today. So with that, let's get uh, started. Uh, so our, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Martin Visbeck, who's gonna be our first uh, presenter here. And he's gonna speak to us a bit about uh, the motivation for ocean observing co-design. And so Martin, thank you for joining, over to you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, dear colleagues around the world, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to introduce to you a little bit uh, my view on today's workshop and how that is uh, set itself or located within the global process. Clearly, uh, colleagues, uh, we are in what I call the decade of the ocean. Uh, this decade is exciting on the one hand, because just the last year we launched the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development that already speaks to the main points, that is, how can ocean sciences be transformed, contribute to sustainable development in generic terms, and in particular, the ocean dimensions of that. It's a very exciting agenda around the world because the multilateral processes, that is the policy negotiations around the planet, are picking up uh, the importance of the ocean. I'll mention the IPCC, the panel on climate, IPBES, the panel on biodiversity, but also the World Ocean Assessment all show that indeed the ocean is important today, as we all know, you are the expert, but also looking forward for the generations to come. So they're really recognizing around the world the importance of what we do. On the other hand, they also have a need then for sustained generation of information around the ocean. What is happening in the ocean today? How did we come to where we are? And in particular, what is happening in the future? And they need that for a wide range of purposes. And many of the uses are maybe more outside of our traditional ocean science disciplines, which probably more than half of the attendees would 
identify themselves with. I certainly would. I, I work at GEOMA, the Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, so I'm an ocean scientist. So then the question that one can immediately ask, I think that is the, at the heart of this workshop, is our current observing system fit for purpose in the light of these wider agendas? And are we resourced uh, of that observing system in the right manner, in a sustainable manner? John Bell from the European Commission sometimes brought this idea that I think in ocean observing in ocean sciences, we need to go from niche to norm, meaning we're not only supplying the experts, that is the scientists, the ocean expert as such, but the norm meaning we think ocean observations are increasingly needed to actually govern and run coastal communities, coastal states, countries. So is our system ready for that? Is it set up for that? So at the same time, this year is a particular ocean year. In a few weeks, we have the second UN Ocean Conference focusing on the Sustainable Development Goal 14 about the ocean. That will be in Lisbon, hosted to, together by the governments of Portugal and Kenya, but it'll be in Lisbon. And many of us remember uh, the first uh, ocean conference in New York a few years back, same place, David and Sabrina, where you are right now. So uh, as the decade unfolds, the decade is supported by what they call decade programs. These are truly international, large groups of people coming together, advancing that agenda about transforming the ocean science, making ocean science relevant for ocean development. And one of these ocean programs is ocean observing co-design. This is why we're here to discuss the elements. And its idea is to create really a system, an observing system that is co-designed with observing, modeling, key stakeholders as part of it. And I think that's the right way of arriving at a definition of what a fit for purpose system might look at. Now, uh, the ocean observing co-design program as such will be in, in, in large ways interacting with other elements. For example, the Global Ocean Observing System as a UN organized system has uh, supported three programs. So one is the Ocean Observing Co-Design that we're discussing today, but another one is Coast Predict that will redefine the science of observing and predicting the global coastal ocean. And I think it's interesting that Coast Predict obviously as the name says, focus on the coast in the context of the decade, uh, ocean science for sustainable development, well, where is sustainable developing mostly happening? It mostly happens around the coast. So I think there's a clear need to make sure that our global observing system and the prediction that it enables really focus on the coast and deliver in the coastal areas. And I think that's what Coast Predict uh, works on. The other element is observing together. And here, the idea is to really transform uh, the ocean data access, the availability from things that we know in the ocean observing community to those community that we serve. And I think this observing together also brings the point to life that ocean observation is done by satellites increasingly, by in situ system that the global ocean observing system is largely advancing, but we have new actors. There's citizen science, there's industrial science, private actors, NGOs, all of them have information to contribute to us. So I think observing together is another of these programs that will help us in this co-design agenda. So let me use my last few minutes to talk about a program that I'm leading with many colleagues around the world. It's called DITO. It's about digital twins of the ocean. So digital twins are, the aspiration is to build a digital version of the real ocean system, but it comes from engineering and the idea of digital twinning is to optimize design. So in digital twins, there is a process, or you can imagine this program as one that allows us to what I call future-proofing ocean sustainable development. And the way it's done, it merges data from observing systems that we will discuss today. And in this wider definition of observing system, the elements that Goose has, but also what stakeholders, citizens, industry, and so on bring to the table fused with uh, ocean predictive systems. So there can be ocean models, dynamic ones, AI ones, process models. And together, this information system will be then able to answer what if questions that informs human intervention. So what if sea level rise and I build a dike or I build a sandbar or I regrow coral or I save my mangroves. So these what if questions are really supporting uh, the design of human interventions to optimize them, to minimize the negative impacts, to optimize the outcomes, but also doing it in a cost-effective and socially acceptable way. So digital twinning is a very exciting 
topic. We had a great uh, G7 sponsored uh, discussion around that a few weeks back in London. And it's very clear that digital twins also has particular elements or requests to an observing system. And we're very keen to work with all of you to really co-design the ocean observing system of the future, which is again, the goal of the workshop. So from my end, I'm quite looking forward to the outcome and the discussion of the workshop. Unfortunately, I have to sign off for a moment. I'm here at the International Science Council in Paris, one of the sponsors of, of the Global Ocean Observing System Program and also of the decade. And I wish you great discussions. And I think it's the right time to have this discussion. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And I'm looking forward to the outcomes. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and uh, we will probably have some questions, but we will ask uh, them later. So now we, we have uh, David that uh, will uh, present uh, uh, the program as a whole and what are the main objectives uh, to guide in this workshop. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you, Martin, as well. So let's go on to the next slide. So as, as Martin noted, we, um, we're all realizing there is increased uh, demand for ocean knowledge, ocean information, ocean observations. Our aim really in the part of this ocean observing co-design program is to indeed transform how we think about and implement an ocean observing system that's truly fit for purpose. Uh, we are going to be moving towards a system driven by users and stakeholders, and we want to do so more quickly so we can more quickly uh, show benefit from our ocean observing investment. Uh, here, I would just like to acknowledge uh, my co-chairs, Sabrina and Emma, and acknowledge also the growing international team of support that we have enlisted to help move this program forward. Uh, in response to this workshop and to the exemplar development discussions, we're going to have an exciting day. And uh, as you've noted, we're all gathered here in New York as, as a team, and we really appreciate the international interest uh, and discussion. We understand there's over 300 registrants for the workshop this week. We, so we thank you for that participation and hope that you will uh, continue your engagement in, in the program as we move forward. So let's, do, let's talk a bit more about the Ocean Observing Co-Design Program. Next slide. So as I indicated, you know, for we've seen this, in, we've been working actually together collectively for more than 30 years to establish an initial ocean observing system. And we've done so in response to a number of needs, including uh, scientific research, climate, uh, and weather, and, climate, and, 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 and many other needs. But we're noting, for example, many of the interest here in the center of this particular diagram coming to the table and asking for more information about the, the ocean. They're demanding this information because they're having to make decisions on policy. They're having to make decisions for life uh, for health of the ocean and, and a lot of other needs. And it's our duty and part of the ocean observing, part of the objectives of this ocean observing co-design is to be responsive to those needs. Um, the ocean observing co-design program is going to help new communities to form, to encourage new relationships amongst observationists, modelers, data scientists, users, researchers, and as Martin noted, private sector, private interest, uh, indigenous and local communities, even early career scientists and others who are gonna to contribute towards the next version of the ocean observing system. Next slide. So in a sense, ocean observing co-design is gonna be developing a more user-focused co-design process to create the next version of the ocean observing system that'll be more integrated and more responsive to all of our, all of the stakeholder needs for that ocean knowledge. The statement uh, sums up really the ambition of our program. And by 2030, we will have processes and tools that will be modular, globally applicable to more rapidly and effect, to more globally and effectively develop and evaluate our ocean observing system to inform our investment sponsors and communities who need this ocean information. Next slide. So let's just recap our objectives for this particular program. Indeed, we are looking to provide our national government funders the information needed to target their investment globally, regionally, and locally for a new ocean observing uh, capabilities. Secondly, we're looking to make this ocean observing and information more accessible and impactful. And Martin alluded to the, the range of tools that we envision 
uh, that will be developed. So our third objective here is developing those diagnostics tools, the capabilities uh, to better assess the fitness for purpose, uh, to evolve the requirements and those use inspired needs. And so we envision through this co-design program that we will indeed be able to more quickly evaluate our successes, demonstrate the value and develop this international capacity. So again, we are going to be lastly here establishing this capacity and the infrastructure. So that means new processes, new groups of people, new types of relationships to effectively evaluate and demonstrate the inherent value of this new observing capabilities. Next slide. So the program benefits, as you might imagine, there are a range of benefits we envision by 2030. So for example, we anticipate better uh, our capabilities to better track current and future state of the oceans, including to address such questions about um, ocean carbon uptake and whether that will continue and to what extent. We will also be able to predict and warm more skillfully. So one of our exemplars is in fact focused on cyclones, which if you're in the path of a hurricane or a cyclone, you are watching that very closely. And we've already demonstrated and know that the ocean plays a role in the intensity of, of those cyclones. We need to take better advantage of that capability, build that into our forecast, provide that to the users so they can respond and get out of the way or take shelter. We also envision that the program will be able to help us to manage our ocean resources much more skillfully. Another one of our exemplars is focused on marine life in 2030. And how are we going to make sure that we manage that with an aim towards sustainability? We also envision empowering society to adapt to change whether it be through ocean change directly or changes of our environment that may manifest themselves through climate over land, through increased uh, occurrences of drought or severe weather. And lastly, we intend to, uh, the program will intend to assess the impact of our action towards a sustainable ocean. Next slide. So with our kickoff meeting here, again, we appreciate everyone joining. We intend to uh, convene uh, stakeholders, end users, experts, uh, observationalists, and modelers, and others around the world through what we're calling exemplars. For example, like I mentioned, the hurricane exemplar, the cyclones exemplar, and there are several others we're going to be talking about this week. We intend for this meeting also to develop and help support communities who are going to build around these exemplars and help build and develop and co design improved observing systems, bringing to bear the best in technology, the best in capabilities that might we might be aware of or that might exist out there we need to tie into. We also envision the meeting this week to help be able to assess and understand the current state and the gaps of our observing system, and not just the observing system, but the types of relationships necessary to co-design. So we recognize that oftentimes just having discussions and identifying stakeholders, talking with stakeholders, uh, it, it's, it's a time consuming task. It takes time and energy and we need, we need to determine and help kick off that process this week to, to undertake those processes and new types of discussions. Uh, as I mentioned, we hope that this uh, workshop this week will bring to us and engage a variety of stakeholders and bring them to the table to have these conversations. And again, looking across that range from observational capabilities all the way to end users. And lastly, we hope that this week will begin the process to assess and understand and appreciate st stakeholder needs, incorporating them seamlessly into this co-design process. And we realize also that this is the first of what will likely to be many activities, workshops, uh, conferences, to help us uh, undertake this co-design program and achieve success. It will not be the, uh, the last meeting. It will not be uh, the only meeting. So there's a lot of work ahead of us and we appreciate that we're not gonna be able to solve all of the problems today. Next slide. <clears throat> I've mentioned exemplars. So we've identified these um, first areas of exemplars around use areas. Um, and we view that these exemplars are going to be the, the topics around which we envision active and interactive development and discussion, uh, relationship building around this co-design process. We envision that these exemplars will 
give a voice and visibility to community needs. So from stakeholders and those from the observationalists, the modeling, the, the data experts, the data analysts, the, all of those in that sort of uh, connection between observing and use to, to build that community to again, foster a co-design activity. We've identified a, a first set of, of exemplars um, with an eye towards uh, these particular topics because we felt that they were uh, well suited. There were demands for the type of information around these topics that are very topical. And Martin mentioned some of the some of the origins of some of some of these exemplars. And we know that there are communities waiting and wanting information about some of these about these topics. And we hope that that will foster, these discussions will foster those connections between the observationalists who are interested in observing for a purpose and the end users who want to use that knowledge. Uh, the focus of these is how far is it gonna help, again, bring a voice and visibility. And, and we're listing here these exemplars. There are only six, they're the first six. There are likely to be many more in the future. We felt that we had to start somewhere and we felt that these were a good choice given that we had numerous proposals and under the UN Decade Program, we've had communities of building around these that already existed. And so again, just focusing on these as our initial six. Next slide. So we hope by the end of uh, this week of the next three days that um, we have some very specific outcomes in mind. First of all, we're intending the discussions this week to be aimed towards developing um, an outline or a scoping of specific proposals for projects uh, that would propose and advance our work under exemplars. And we will develop this proposal with an eye towards engaging uh, financial sponsors, whether it be from governments, from private sector, or uh, other types of sponsors who could help support the, the work plans for these particular types of proposals. Secondly, we're intending the discussions to, to inform the, the writing of a paper to present our initial thoughts around co-design best practices. And I recognize that there's a lot of thoughts. And so we're gonna be asking this week, your thoughts about what makes a good sort of go to co-design process. What have, what have been your experiences, your thoughts? What are the key attributes the key types of relationships, the key members of that co-design team. And so we'll be asking your thoughts around that. And if um, you have thoughts that we don't touch upon or think about them later outside of our discussion period today, please drop them in the chat box uh, in, in Slack and let us know what your thoughts are. Secondly, we're also looking to identify um, upcoming opportunities to advertise the benefits of the co-design program and bring more interest to it. We will uh, be planning to develop a, an advertisement or a flyer, which will summarize some of the exemplar benefits and the key activities of those exemplars. One such outcome uh, immediately on the horizon is the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. And so we envision that will be an opportunity we will go to and have these exemplars in hand and be able to say to those audiences, yes, the ocean observing community is working on a more inclusive a set of efforts around these exemplars. Here are the benefits. Come join the program and be part of it and help be part of the observing system development over the next decade. Next slide. And I think that's all I had. So, yes, Sabrina, so thank, thank, you thank you very much, much David. And if you have any questions, please drop on the Slack and we will take the question and discussion later on. So we go now to the first session and we will focus on the lesson learned of the 20 or 30 years old uh, regional observing system that we have in our uh, tropical uh, oceans in Indian Ocean, a little bit larger than just the tropic. So uh, <clears throat> this session will be moderated by Wei Dong Yu from, uh, uh, Yusan, uh, from uh, San Yu uh, University in China. And we'll hear about uh, tropical, uh, the Tropical Pacific observing uh, system by Billy Kessler. Renelis Perez uh, uh, will pre present the Tropical Atlantic observing system and Juliet Hermes, the Indian Ocean observing system. So thank you very much and uh, Wei Dong, it's... Uh... Yes, thank you, Sapina. So welcome to the session one. So we will hear 
we will hear, as Sapina mentioned, uh, our colleagues will tell us a very exciting story what is happening over the three uh, tropical ocean basins uh, from the last uh, decades to the next few uh, decades. So it's, uh, I will leave the time to our uh, colleagues. So our three colleagues, uh, pre, uh, please be aware. So every uh, each of you have uh, three, uh, seven minutes. So keep on time. So the last for the last minute, I will turn on my video. So you will know is, there is only one minute left. Then followed by uh, 30 minutes of discussion. So, okay. So first uh, we invite uh, Billy Kessler to talk about TIPOS. Billy, time is yours. Yes, um, thank you, Wei Dong, and uh, thank you, David and Sabrina, for having me. Uh, so I have only three slides, and hopefully I should get through them in seven minutes. Uh, can you see? Yes, there, there they are. Okay, so um, TIPOS 2020, the Tropical Pacific Observing System 2020, began specifically as a response to the crisis of the moored arrays in the tropical Pacific. So that's both the uh, Triton array of Jamstech in the West and the Tau array of NOAA uh, across the Eastern and Central Pacific. And the tropical Pacific has, uh, we could say a blessing and a curse, and that is ENSO. And so from the very beginning, the, uh, the wide, the global effects of El Nino uh, were very obvious, uh, became obvious in the 1980s, and also the possibility of predicting both the El Ninos themselves and their impacts drove a tremendous investment by nations around the Pacific, really around the world, in building and observing system. And so uh, that was uh, the blessing that we had the uh, essentially the funding to build this kind of system. The curse was that uh, it was uh, really seen by many agencies, including my own, as serving a single need, and that is ENSO forecasting. And especially as the, uh, our ability to improve our forecasts, which had, we made great progress in the 1980s and the 1990s. And then when progress stalled, uh, interest uh, lagged interest decayed and the uh, support for those arrays began to uh, diminish. And so we saw the problem that led to this uh, crisis of both the, the two moored arrays as looking at them as serving a single interest and that is and so forecasting and not appreciating the very diverse needs that an observing an ocean observing system can serve and that led to uh, lack of use it led to loss of agency interest and the uh, decay and the crisis that uh, was our charge to fix and so we began um, trying to, to, to uh, meet that challenge, but we soon tried to turn it into an opportunity. Next slide, please. Yes, so uh, we developed uh, an integrated vision of what we consider to be the backbone, and those are the sustained obs observations that will always be going on, and will provide the, the skeleton on which uh, research and regional studies uh, can then uh, hang there, can serve as the background for those. And there are two, uh, when I uh, heard co-design, I thought, well, we have two and they're uh, illustrated here. And one is between uh, in situ and remote sensing. So you see those over on the left. Uh, the three elements of our backbone are Argo, uh, the moored arrays, and the satellite constellation. And whereas researchers like me will have our, our favorite instrument that we know very deeply, uh, uh, and we write papers about them, uh, in fact, uh, it takes this uh, whole uh, constellation of both in situ and remote uh, sensing to uh, uh, adequately observe the ocean and the climate. And so uh, we saw that as fundamental and that we were not focused on any particular piece. We were looking at how those fit together. And the other uh, co that we saw uh, in this picture is that is the role of models and the uh, data simulation systems. And we realize that uh, even though a researcher knows their data and their instrument very well, um, in fact, 
most users, most of our stakeholders get Tropical Pacific data as the output of an assimilation. Did we lose my, that slide? And anyway, I'll just talk. So um, uh, while uh, I use data that comes raw from an instrument, um, most people don't. Uh, most of our users and the drivers of the funding for this system use the output of an assimilation, which has two advantages. One is that the very diverse data sources that have disparate sampling characteristics that are difficult to uh, fit together, that the way we saw the way to do that was through an assimilation that was able to take this diverse sampling and turn it into a useful product. So um, we saw the connection to the models as fundamental, that development of the models was as important as the development of any of these particular instruments, and that the models also allow us to essentially interpolate, that we will never observe everything. The oceans will always be undersampled, and it's only through an increasingly uh, uh, accurate and uh, coherent assimilation that we will develop a clear picture of the oceans, their circulation, and their impacts of the, around the, the climate itself. Okay, and the next slide, please. So uh, this slide, I'm not going to read this all to you. This is meant to um, serve as a basis for discussion. Um, we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, had our final a steering committee meeting of TPOS 2020. And this was our list of uh, what worked and a little bit of what didn't work. And I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but I wanna first uh, talk about the first two, which were uh, in that complex of listening to our stakeholders. And we paid uh, close attention to both the priorities and the constraints of our agency sponsors. We uh, always said to ourselves, we work for our sponsors. Um, we're not presenting a wish list. We're trying to fit what uh, we saw as the observing needs uh, into what each agency was able to do and what fit what th their mandates. And one of those things was that we were willing to prioritize. And you know, as a uh, working researcher who uh, lives and dies on the success of my proposals, um, it's very easy to uh, ask for everything. And uh, in TPOS 2020, we very deliberately said that, uh, no, that was not what we were doing here, that we were trying to identify what are the priorities? What are the things that can be traded off that we won't be able to do now? Uh, and so we have big dreams and we could stay, stay, state those dreams, but we were uh, realists. And I think that was very important in our, uh, our success. Uh, we'll talk about, another uh, important part was that we uh, uh, had a, an ongoing review process and a revision that let us incorporate a broader community vision. And what that means is that we published three long reports. And for each of those reports, we published a draft and sought comments. And uh, without being as rigorous as the IPCC, we uh, 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 um, listed every single comment. We responded to every single comment in public. And in that way, we saw that we were uh, incorporating a much larger uh, set of wisdom and knowledge than uh, we might have otherwise. Um, and finally, I'll say that uh, we engaged, we very seriously engaged with the WMO. And in 2017, we were, became a WIGOS regional pilot. And that was very important because it gave us entree to the meth services. And whereas the people who organized and led T plus 2020 were largely researchers like myself, uh, in fact, in order to uh, build our connections to the uh, data simulation, to the, to the uh, prediction centers that have that capability, we needed to engage through the MET services. And so that was a very important piece of uh, our success. 
And um, we can also talk about what didn't work as well. And at the beginning of TPOS 2020, we saw the boundary regions. So that is the, uh, the upwelling circulations along the South American coast and the low latitude Western boundary currents along the uh, coast of uh, Australia and Asia, that uh, those were fundamental to an observing system in the tropical Pacific. And it wasn't just uh, the, the mid-ocean, um, the, the, the board arrays and the Argo and the satellites that look at this uh, stuff that's happening away from the coasts. Uh, we tried hard to uh, engage those near coastal communities and we were less than successful. Uh, and I think uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. Part of it is money and part of it is uh, a fractured set of stakeholders who didn't necessarily uh, work together well. And it became, uh, we were less than successful in engaging in those parts. And I hope that in the future, that, that that's something that I look forward to fostering as we move into the future. So thank you. So thank you, Billy. So it's, uh, well, we uh, have some, I, I noticed we have some questions, but we will uh, have that discussion after we finish the three presentations, okay? So then the next uh, we will move to the uh, presentation by uh, our colleagues, uh, yeah, Rinelli, to talk about uh, a, uh, a tropical Atlantic, a toss. So now time is yours, uh, Rinelli. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I don't see my slides yet, but I'll just start. So hello everybody, my name is Rinelis Perez. I'm an oceanographer at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. I'm involved in the Multinational Prediction and Research Mortar Array in the Tropical Atlantic Program, or PARADA, and I'm presenting on behalf of all of the authors that contributed to the Taos Tropical Atlantic Observing System Review. This report was led by the Clivar Atlantic Regional Panel in collaboration with the PARADA team, supported by the agencies that are identified on the slide. And I guess you are not seeing the slide still. Should I just keep going? I didn't see your presentation. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be being presented for me. Yeah. All right, I'll just keep going. So, so the thank you. Um, so the the Tropical Atlantic Observing System was last reviewed in 2006 by Clivar and Gku's Goose WCRP through the OOPC Ocean Observations Panel for Climate. And back then, the primary focus was on the Parada Backbone Array. Next slide, please. And since then, uh, Parada has evolved to, to include more sensors and sites. Um, the Tropical Atlantic Observing System has grown with the inclusion of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Arrays in the Tropical Atlantic, the expansion of the Argo and Drifter programs with increasing deployments in the Tropical Atlantic. Next slide, please. Repeated hydrographic and expendable bathythermograph transects, satellite measurements, surface carbon measurements for moorings, ships, and gliders. And so a new Taos review was proposed to evaluate the scientific progress since the last review and recommend actions to advance sustained observing efforts in the tropical Atlantic. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is just showing you the lead authors and contributing authors to the document. We, we included sub subject matter experts from a variety of sectors, ocean, atmospheric, and climate scientists, satellite oceanographers, modelers, forecasters, funders, and data scientists. Next slide, please. There were two science meetings in 2018 in the United States and France adjacent to other well-attended meetings with the drafting of the workshop and the final report happening from 2018 to 2021. The kickoff meeting had 30 participants and the main goals were to define the requirements for the Taos observing system um, and review the present status of the network. The second workshop was held following the annual Parada meeting that was attended by 50 scientists. And the main goal of this workshop was to finalize recommendations for future Taos. There were also parallel efforts happening at that time. There was the Ocean OBS 19, and there was a Parada review that happened, which involved some of the same scientists, but they were sort of done as parallel efforts. Next slide, please. 
The meeting focused on a host of science and operational drivers for the Taos, how the variability of the tropical Atlantic affects the weather, the rainfall, temperature of surrounding continents, and also impacts the biogeochemistry in the region and marine ecosystems. Next slide, please. So Taos um, brought in subject, uh, subject matter experts to participate in the review. We tried to get representatives from a variety of sectors, but the short time frame and the resources uh, meant that sometimes there was only one or two representatives from the categories that we involved. Recommendations were made that focused on key science and operational drivers that are listed on the slide. And um, we took a, a focus on the essential ocean and climate variables and tried to define the time and space scales needed to observe them. Recommendations were made to improve the existing elements of Taos and also consider what possibilities were offered by new technology and future process studies. We made recommendations on how to improve the operational usage of the data, how, to how Taos could govern itself going forward and evaluate the process of Taos um, and bring in more stakeholders. And one thing that was discussed was uh, biannual Taos forums and also uh, uh, decadal Taos reviews. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of its connection with modeling and data assimilation communities, Taos has existed for over 25 years with significant model related activities. There weren't um, OSSEs, observing system simulation experiments conducted specifically for Taos. However, um, OSSEs have been performed in the tropical Atlantic and those results were considered by the review uh, process. Um, we have a very strong connection with the satellite communities. Taos observations are crucial for satellite calibration and validation. There's a natural connection in that both of these observations in situ and satellite measurements are both used for weather and climate prediction. The availability of new data sets from satellites such as sea surface salinity gave us a better understanding of ocean dynamical processes and air-sea interactions. Assimilation of products like chlorophyll A from satellites is leading to improved reanalysis of net primary production. Next slide, please. So in terms of engaging with stakeholders, we tried to include classical stakeholders and end users, mostly from the countries that were participating in the Taos observing programs. Um, but we also tried to include additional stakeholders from all of the countries bordering the tropical Atlantic and a variety of sectors that are less classical. Uh, many participated, but a relatively short review process unfortunately doesn't provide the the framework for sufficient engagement with stakeholders. And the Taos uh, Review recommended these every two year Taos Forum to try to bring in more stakeholders. This hasn't happened due to the pandemic, but I think you know, our comfort level with these virtual webinars as we're all attending right now uh, has demonstrated that it might be easier to uh, more cost effectively engage with stakeholders via online forums. Taos used the standard approach uh, employed uh, by Clivar, Goose, and Parada previously to review the observing system, but we also learned from um, large field experiment reviews like the TPOS effort that Billy just told us about. We defined essential ocean climate variables and, and used those as the requirements to guide us on how to best address the key science and societal drivers for Taos, but we weren't able to integrate those requirements in a transdisciplinary fashion across all of the drivers. Next slide, please. So our biggest success was we were able to transition from a vision of the tropical Atlantic observing system as just a sum of disparate observing systems to a vision of an integrated fit for purpose Taos. Uh, biggest failure, which I probably should have said our, our least success, uh, like Billy did, which I thought was a great way to phrase it, was not being able to integrate the essential ocean variable, essential climate variable requirements across all of the scientific and societal drivers. That proved to be a difficult and challenging task. It may not be possible. What's required for observing biology and observing physics and chemistry might just be different scales. Um, the last thing is that more progress can be made towards developing the multi-purpose use of the tropical Atlantic observ observing system and um, having a more enhanced engagement with stakeholders and end users from a variety of sectors and from all of the countries bordering the tropical Atlantic, which sounds a lot like what Billy was saying at the end of his presentation. With that, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. So we will uh, move to another basin, the tropical Pacific, uh, tropical area uh, in the ocean. So we invite uh, Julia to uh, present uh, your, yeah, your talk.
Great, thanks. I think Andrea is going to pull up the slides for me. So I'm Juliet Hermes from Cape Town, but I'm currently in a hotel lobby in New York. But I actually think the background music adds quite a nice touch as I speak. Um, so I run the Offshore Observing Program for the South African Environmental Observation Network, and I'm the co-chair of the Clive Art Indian Ocean Regional Panel. Uh, I just want to thank you for inviting me to talk about the Indian Ocean Observing as an exemplar. And I think to set the scene, it's really important to give a bit of context and history first. So I'll just keep going while An Andrea pulls up the slides. Um, so the Indian Ocean Basin is surrounded by 22 countries, which contain almost one third of the global population. Many of these are vulnerable to extreme weather events and climate change. And these rim countries really depend on rain-fed agriculture, which is tightly linked to monsoon rainfall. So it's been really imperative from the onset of planning sustained observations in the Indian Ocean that these countries are part of the discussions and that their needs are taken into account. So based on these scientific and societal needs, uh, an implementation plan for INDUS was put together by the WCRP Clivar and the Goose Indian Ocean Panel in 2006. OSSEs were carried out for the original INDUS design, providing justification for measurement locations and sampling frequency. Hopefully my slides will come up. Um, oh, there we go. So a few years later, it was clear the need was necessary, um, the need for the necessary resources to sustain induce. But additional needs were also there to improve coordination across platforms and regional and basin scale programs, and to improve data and product distribution and to enhance capacity in Indian Ocean Rim countries. As a result of these recommendations, the Indus Resources Forum and the Sustained Indian Ocean Biogeochemistry and Ecosystem Research Panel was formed. The IRF consists of national representatives from those countries funding Indus to assess performance and facilitate and coordinate the provision of the resources and to promote um, contributions from institutions in the participating countries. So coordination across platforms and regional and basin scale programs has remained a priority of the Indian Ocean Regional Panel and of INDUCE, the Indian Ocean Observing System. And the IRF has really helped to achieve this. But we also continue to ensure that members of the regional panel include active regional scientists. So this really sort of highlights the co-design approach that was taken early on in INDUCE. Besides the regional process, the INDUCE also contributes to the understanding of interbasin interactions with joint inputs of observation data from other basins. So if INDUCE, there's real benefit in hearing um, the experience of the other observing systems. Co-design really shouldn't be limited to the individual ocean basins, and it's a great opportunity to begin to explore longer term issues like integration of new technologies, the tropical arrays, ocean observing in general, and cultivating new partners and solutions. So the Clive R. Goose workshop from global to coastal, cultivating new solutions and partnerships for an enhanced ocean observing system in a decade of accelerating change, will really provide a good opportunity for sharing similar challenges faced by different regions. Um, so if I could go to the next slide, looking at, at what worked with Indus. Since um, the original Indus, the societal and scientific priorities and measurement technologies have evolved and many practicalities of implementation have been learned to ensure Indus remains responsive. Um, I don't know if the slide hasn't moved for me, but never mind. So to this end, a review was initiated in 2017 by the a regional panel with the close cooperation of many partners and finalized at the end of 2019. Ultimately, the Indus review is in itself the best example of co-design. Um, and the slide that you should be seeing, oh, there it is, um, just shows some of the TOCs of the review. During the review, the capacities of each observing array, including satellite observations in addressing the scientific and operational <coughs> drivers were waived in, along with the practicality. An extensive and responsive community review process was held. Experts were called in for cross-platform discussions along with stakeholders over a number of workshops to work through divergent views. And this helped in preparing um, essential variables and also identifying the platforms that would monitor these EVs efficiently. And then following this, a list of tiered priority recommendations were made. Um, I'm not going to go into those, but this slide also shows at the bottom there the numbers of Induce 2. Um, so you can see 
how many emails were sent and just the kind of real approach to open stakeholder engagement that there was. INDUS provides a framework to facilitate, support and enhance not just one or two regional programs, but several nations and agencies coming together and that's really been supported by the IRF. And to this effect, there were six key regional um, process efforts which should be sustained um, in the recommendations um, um, highlighted as part of the review. So if we go to slide three to look at the end users, when it comes to end users, it's really the severe fragmentation of data supplied by end use and many other sources that's a major challenge. So in particular for economic decision makers and those involved in the planning, the monitoring and reporting of the wider efforts to achieve sustainable development in the Indian Ocean region in line with these national priorities and the international commitments. So one of the major successes arising from Indus has been the NOAA MOAS agreement and the launch of the Joint Oceanographic Data Portal. So that's really been providing op opening up the access to the Indian Omni mooring data. And the next step really is to get to open up the data from moorings in the EEZs of the countries. And this has been really highlighted in the Indus review. Opportunities also exist to leverage the capability of global data analysis and communication initiatives for the benefit of ocean observation, <coughs> specifically tailored to meeting societal needs in the Indian Ocean region. And there's really a strong need that Indian Ocean Rim countries have access to the data produced through Indus, as well as understanding its applications. And the no immerse agreement is a great first step towards this. So the next and final slide, um, just to look at the successes and challenges. So one of the successes of Indus and, and a real key co-design component has been the involvement of the Indian Ocean Rim countries. And having people in the same room really makes a difference and helps to break communication barriers. The Indus review really made contacts and brought in many new people and it just wouldn't have worked as well on an online platform. We really needed to create that community. The commitment to ensuring under-resourced countries are part of the Indian Ocean Regional Panel and supporting their involvement, as well as early career scientists forming ambassadors for Indus, helps to ensure the success and sustainability of Indus. And a great example arising from this approach in the top left-hand corner, you can see the advert for it, is the Clyde Barpogo Western Indian Ocean Regional Training Workshop on observing the coastal and marginal seas in the Western <coughs> Indian Ocean. And that's happening this week and is led by the IORP early career member, Dr. Bernardino Maoleni from Mozambique. So we're really looking forward to seeing what comes out of that workshop. Um, and then just quickly looking at the challenges, many faced by sustained ocean observing systems, by sustained observing systems over the Indian Ocean are common to all basin wide observing systems. However, the Indian Ocean has its own unique challenges due to the physics of the basin, as well as the problems within the Indian Ocean countries that really rely heavily on coastal regions for food security. As we've seen with COVID, doesn't matter how well you plan for something, what really counts is how you're able to respond to unplanned issues. And we need to think how to take that into account with the co-design approach. So just finishing up really to highlight that observations in the Indian Ocean are at a critical level and activities on the decrease. Um, and you can see here the Argo array, uh, how much it's diminished. And also the Rama array is now functioning at about 10% of activity. Continuing to strengthen regional and international partnerships is really essential to sustainably redeploy the observing platforms. In addition, special focus needs to be placed on access to EEZs for observing system components and on capacity, resource and coordination development of RIM countries. Ultimately, a key factor of best affecting investment in scientific research and the success of co-design and where we really feel that Goose is in a unique position to be able to support is the level of appreciation by national governments and stakeholders of the importance of the marine sector to the country's economy and to the resources. Thank you. So thank you, Julia. It's a, a very nice talk uh, and also a very nice music. Hey. I think after these three presentations, we already collected uh, some questions in a, in a, in a Slack. So uh, I found that some questions are very common, not only for one presentation, but for the three presentations. So I firstly, I would like to uh, raise the uh, questions to uh, Billy's. Uh, yeah, Billy's, after your presentation, you say uh, there are mainly three concerns or questions in a, in a, in a box. So the first one uh, the, they are asking is how many institutions or countries are using the TPOS data? So this is relevant to the uh, end user. So it's really, can you answer a little bit? 
Um, no, I don't have a good answer for that. And the reason is that uh, I, I guess I see that for most users, the best way to get TPOS data is as the output of a credible assimilation and not as the particular data uh, that, you know, for example, I run a, my, my own research, a glider network in, <clears throat> in the Solomon Sea. And that data is used by the Solomon Islands and by Papua New Guinea and by Australia and by researchers who, uh, you know, the data is, is easily available, but the main contribution of those kind of individual or small efforts, or even the larger efforts, is as they feed into and help guide and correct uh, an assimilated product. I mean, we have so many different kinds of instruments out there. And even if you just consider the, the constellation of satellites and moorings and Argo, um, very few users who are not researchers are going to try to put that information together on their own. And so I really see the, the, the development of models and the development of the simulation systems as the, the key way that we as uh, ocean observers contribute data. Okay, thanks, Billy. I, I, I believe this question or uh, it's uh, somewhat related to what we are uh, uh, approaching in, within a uh, UN decade uh, that is uh, accessible ocean. So it's a uh, it's a uh, yeah, TPOS and other observing system are producing is a new data stream and more accessible to all the users. So the second question is uh, somewhat uh, relevant to to this one is that uh, the uh, modeling and data simulation. So how this modeling and data simulation is a uh, feedback to the uh, observing system design. So. Yeah, please. Uh, I, uh, is that that's a question for me? Okay, so yes. we are now um, initiating uh, a, an experiment, and this involves the NOAA and ECMWF and JMA, and possibly others will be joining. We're still at the beginning, where uh, we're doing an experiment with Tau, where we have the Tau array as it is now. And then we have the uh, enhanced tau that NOAA is in the process of uh, implementing. And those will be run uh, uh, for three years in parallel, both systems. And the, the three centers are, will be conducting an assimilation of those two different uh, data regimes uh, in parallel. And so, uh, and you know, not in real time, but eventually we will be able to make uh, for seasonal forecasts, feed those into the global forecast systems and actually be able to tell uh, what, so we made many recommendations and there are many improvements that are uh, in, pro in process right now. Uh, we will be able to tell in three to four years time, uh, how much difference did those actually make and where? Okay. So I, I, in fact, I noticed that this question is also is also uh, uh, emphasized uh, mentioned in the uh, Renelli's presentation talking about TOS. You emphasize you have a very uh, close, a strong connection with the modeling and data simulation community. So it's a, so it's a really, Would you like to say something? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's important. I, what I really liked hearing in uh, David Legler's presentation is the interest in building infrastructure to do these types of experiments. Because one thing that we learned during the Taos and Sabrina can chime in if she if she would like is that you know the the modeling community and the data simulation community doesn't have the bandwidth to do this for every observing system. What Billy mentioned, um, you know, maybe they have the bandwidth to do it for TPOS and Argo, a few of them but it takes a lot of energy and a lot of personnel and resources to do these operational runs, operational level runs, uh, withholding one type of observing uh, uh, system and seeing what the impact is. So I think that that it's heartening to hear that there's going to be attention given to making resources available for that. Um, and then the other thing that I will mention is, is part of the co-design of these observing systems. You have Argo, 
you have drifters in the tropics because we have cruises that are servicing the moorings and deploying them. And we have XBT transects that are happening and deploying them. So there's a bit of a, of a um, the reason the coverage is good for some of these observing systems that are you know, floating around and collecting measurements is because the moored arrays are there constantly reseeding those regions with, with floats and drifters. Yes, thank you. So I, I believe with such kind of a, a connection between the observation community and the modeling community will be enhanced in the future as, as long we are approaching to this direction. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed that there is another uh, interesting uh, question in the box. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, this is uh, uh, relevant to uh, three of you. They, they, uh, they are asking if there any plan or, or uh, some ideas for the co-design across a three year tropical basins. Yeah, you are present uh, in the Ocean Pacific and Atlantic in the video delay. So the question is, uh, how about in the future co-design of the three tropical basins together? So it's a uh, some of you would like to volunteer to answer something? So, I, I mean, can I go? Yes, yes, Julia, please. I think so. Um, Billy and Manelis can speak up, but the, the workshop planned in August, the Kaivaku's workshop, really will be bringing together the different ocean basin um, experts to look at how we can move forward with that. And I think it, it really is a key aspect. As I said, I don't think the co-design can be done on, a, on, a, on one basin alone. We can really learn a lot from each other. So yes, there are steps, I would say, definitely moving forward to that. Billy, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I see Billy's uh, hands. It's, yeah, please, um, please. I, I, actually, I was uh, going to follow on to what Renella said, but um, I'll just also respond to what um, Juliet said, is that about, about uh, co-design, um, it does take a lot of bandwidth and you know as a researcher myself who um, you know my performance rating depends on the papers that i publish and that's true of really everyone in the tpos community um well there's a resistance to additional asks uh, about designing that so i'll just say that but in response to renellis who was um, talking about involving the operational centers. Um, that's where getting involved with the WMO is really important. And the experiments that I mentioned really only happened because we were, T plus 2020 was declared or to be a, a YGOS regional pilot. And before that time, we really had difficulty um, getting involved in with the operational centers. We could talk to individual scientists, but in terms of getting the funding and the people needed to do that, um, that comes through the WMO. And so that's really an essential thing that we need to be doing. Okay, thank you, Billy. It's, I, I see it's uh, really, it's a uh, reading. Would like to see? Yeah, just to follow up on your question. Um, the scientists, science community is pretty small. So some of the people were involved in multiple reviews and we certainly, you know, the TPOS was effort and the, the whole document was available to the Taos group and we knew about the induce efforts. And so there's, there's an overlap in terms of the scientists and we certainly were informed by the other review processes. Yeah, thank you. So I, I see uh, David had another question is so what, what do we learn from engaging small island of indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, communities in our co-design activities? So it's a, uh, yeah. Would you like to share some uh, experience of this, uh, such kind of engagement with small island? I think it's a small island. Uh, yeah, maybe it's in the Indian Ocean Julia or in the Pacific Ocean uh, Billy. You have some experience with the small island uh, engagement? It's Julia. So um, I think as we're moving much more from the offshore ocean observing systems into the coastal regions, that's where we're really going to need to move towards um, indigenous knowledge holders and co-designing efforts more strongly with them. I didn't talk about it so much in the presentation because that wasn't look that that was more past looking, but moving forward, so that's definitely something that we're going to need to work towards, but we're also going to need to appreciate that's going to take a lot more time and a lot more energy 
Um, so I think we have to take that into account. In terms of um, working with a, a small island developing states, I think we can learn a lot, particularly um, the, the issues that they're having are the same in many of the countries that we're having, um, many of the African countries. And so we're actually working together with them, looking at um, developing coastal observing systems for under-resourced countries, um, because I think, you know, we can really work together and learn from each other about problems and solutions. And I don't think these need to be separated between island states and say coastal African countries. Mm -hmm. yeah, hey, uh, yeah, so I guess the main point that I would raise is this takes a tremendous amount of work and a long-term commitment and that the, you can't do uh, what I would call helicopter science where some uh, outside scientists who know a lot about the big ocean, but maybe not very much about some local place come in and say, you know, this is what uh, you people need and we want your support. Um, in fact, this is an effort that takes years and real commitment and building yourself a community. And so, you know, and I, I know this because I do it in the Solomon Islands in Papua New Guinea. And it's a major part of the effort that it takes. So we can't trivialize it and we can't expect that it will happen quickly. And it requires um, a certain kind of people who want to build those relationships. And it is about relationships. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your other uh, your answers. I, I think it's a Due to time limitations, uh, I am reminded we have, maybe we can have an, a last question. So the last one is uh, to what extent do you see the stakeholders can influence a technology choice and platforms for ocean observation, as opposed to more downstream co-design activities like uh, interface and data dissemination rules? Yeah, so that, that, that means uh, whether the stakeholders have any influence on the platform. So, I, I mean, for me, um, oh, no, Renella, as you go, you've got your hand up. Uh, I was just going to refer back to what Billy was saying about, you know, when you're working, for example, with um, under-resourced countries, you can't just go in there and do your ocean observing based on what you want to do as a scientist. And, and they're some of the key stakeholders that we're working with. So you really need to, to begin by co-designing with them what they need. Do they need measurements of the coastal area? And if so, what measurements do they need? Maybe they don't need the essential variables we talk about. Maybe they have their own needs. And so that's something that we really need to take into account. And we can only do that by fully engaging. But as Billy said, that takes a lot of time and effort. Okay, thank you. So any comments from? Yeah, I'll just say I don't I don't think I'm using stakeholders in the same way, but I guess if stakeholders is very broad and that means uh, new scientists with new ideas, I think that all of these observing systems are are platforms for which if you reach out to us and you want to add some sensor to to do a pilot study on these these existing platforms, I think the community is pretty open to that, um, whether it's a moored platform or some other platform, but that's using a different definition of stakeholders than I think the question was intended. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think I, I uh, the meeting, uh, the end, so could you remind us, uh, do we still have some time for some more discussion or we are running out of time? Uh, maybe a last question and uh, I will take in uh, two minutes again, uh, the line. Uh, okay. so is that, the last two minutes we can, uh, yeah, so. And would you like to uh, fade some questions? I, I could not uh, catch all the questions in the box. It's, uh, do we have some excellent question in the box? Would you like to suggest some question we are missing? Oh yeah, yeah. The question is maybe is what about a co-design exemplar for the tropical ocean system and the program? So we already have a, uh, some exemplars listed there. It's a, how about a 
tropical ocean system and uh, uh, as a, a co-design exemplar. This is a uh, yeah similar or relevant to the uh, previous question on the uh, the three basin co coordination. Yeah. So do you have some idea, Speedy? Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up, Sabrina, because um, in fact, the reason that these observing systems were established in the first place is because the tropical oceans have dramatic global effects, um, both the individual basins and the tropics as a whole. And it surprised me when I read that list of exemplars that the many benefits of, of, of predictability that come out of the tropical oceans and you know, I think the tropics are fundamentally more predictable than the mid latitudes. Um, this is something we should be taking advantage of. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it has clear benefits, um, really, around the world, and it's we're set up to do it, and it seems relatively easier than a lot of those other uh, exemplars in the list, in my opinion. Okay. Great. So thank you for your comments. So I, I think it's we are uh, using out uh, the time. So I I, I, I give back to our uh, camera. So well, David and Sapina. Thank you very much, Wei Dong. Thank you very much, all of three of you, for a really the interesting presentation and the, uh, overview and the discussion. So we now go to uh, um, another lesson learned for co-design examples that uh, are perhaps uh, less. Uh, Less uh, old in in terms of um, of uh, 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 installment, but uh, they are also very imp important for for us. So this session is uh, moderated by Anthony Ria from uh, WMO, and uh, we will have presentation from uh, Joan uh, Joellen Russells on the Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observ Observation and Modeling Project. Yosuke Fuji on Ocean Predict Observing System Evaluation Task Team, Eric Anderson on WMO, and Samantha Burgess from the Copernicus Climate Change Services, alias C3S. So, Anthony, are you there? Yes, Sabrina, I'm here. How are you? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, the, the, the voice is to you now. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Sabrina, and, and thanks David. And uh, it's my great pleasure to, to be here to, to to facilitate this session on uh, on some examples of, of co-design. Uh, we'll see some examples from from the ocean community, uh, from the climate community, and from the from the weather community from WMO. I just want to make one last plea: if uh, if Joellen Russell is uh, is available. Uh, and connected, uh, please uh, please make yourself known uh, to to Mairead, uh, O'Donovan uh, or other members of the secretariat. But uh, I think uh, we will have to make a slight adjustment to the program, and I'll ask uh, Yosuke uh, Fuji to go first, please. And this is a presentation on the Ocean Predict Observing System Evaluation Task Team. I will uh, I will follow the the great leader of Wei Dong in in saying that we've got six minutes this time uh, for these presentations. I will do the same after after five minutes. I'll turn my camera on. At six minutes, I'll become a, a little more uh, insistent. So could we could we go to uh, Yusuke, please, if you're ready? Uh, thank you very much. Okay. So I'm Yusuke Fuji. Just a minute. I'm Yosuke Fuji from JMA MRI, and I'm co chairing the Ocean Predict Observing System Evaluation Task Team. And uh, I would like to say thank you to the host for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. Here, I will talk about the co design experiences in the Ocean Predict, Ocean Predict community. So, could you share the slide? And, you know, Ocean Predict is the committee for next please, next page, please. Ocean Predict is a committee for promoting the operational ocean prediction science and I'm to increase the capacity of operational ocean oceanography and to enhance ocean information value chain. Then Ocean Predict has observing system evaluation task team to provide consistent and scientifically justified requirements and feedbacks to observational agencies. 
and the OSEBA TT proposed an UN ticket project synops, that is, synergistic observing network for ocean prediction. And it aimed to identify optimal combination of different ocean observation platforms through observing system design and evaluation, and to develop a simulation method for better observation use. And next page, please. An example of the observing system evaluation is the real-time multi-system evaluation for TPOS 2020. After the tower crisis in 2012-14, we started multi-system ocean analysis intercomparison. This figure shows a comparison of multi-system ensemble spread and number of observations. The number becomes small when spread becomes large. Thus, multi-system ensemble spread can be indicator of how well the ocean field is constrained. Here, the serious request from TPOS 2020 and the collaboration of operational centers such as GMA and ECMWF were the keys of implementing this activity successfully. Next page, please. An EU country also conduct an OSSE OS collaboration named Atlant OS. They use a common nature run and assimilate common synthetic observations in the multi-system OSSE OSS, and this figure shows an example showing the impact of deep, deep algo for constraining abyssal oceans. It should be noted that observational committees in the EU countries, as well as operational centers, contribute to Atlant OS. So the request of observational committee reflected in the configuration of OSSETs. And next page, please. Ocean Predict members have also conducted several studies to evaluate the impact of satellite arithmetic observations in ocean prediction. This slide introduces a result in Mercatore Ocean. And considering a constellation of three nadia and SWOT, ocean analysis errors on sea surface height is reduced by 30% with respect to a three nadia constellation. And their results provide valuable information to continue existing satellite missions and to promote new satellite missions. Next page, please. And we are also currently conducting OSSE collaboration for algal salinity drifts. Abrupt salinity drift is a serious ongoing problem in the algal community. Under the collaboration with the algal community, we are currently conducting OSD collaboration to evaluate the impact of ASD. And ASD is likely to induce a positive trend of the global sanity content. And it is confirmed in several systems. And we also confirm that a quality check procedures by the ARC Global Center is effective. And here, it is important to use multi system to get robust and reliable results. Here, I put some remarks. You know, I hope decent improvement of ocean prediction systems makes it possible to perform fair and reliable evaluation and design of the ocean observing network. However, multi-system approach is indispensable in order to mitigate the influence of system dependency. It requires good coordination and huge computer and human resources. So, Cross collaboration between observational and modeling communities are also important to conduct relevant evaluation and design by uh, properly considering characteristics of observation data. And operational output of ocean prediction system and its byproducts, such as QC information and data misfits, can be used by observational community and further development of, of the system in order to reduce the systematic error and to assimilate observational data more effectively will contribute to increase the capacity of the observing system evaluation. Collaboration should be done also in this direction. Then another change is, in to, it is to extend the activity to global countries. So ocean predict community and SINOBS will support evaluation design of the ocean observing network by the co-design exemplars. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, 
Yes, okay. I think some some great uh, examples there of the way that we can use uh, science and uh, and and the rigor of, of the physics of the models to inform uh, our uh, our understanding of the impacts of, of different observing systems. So I think it's a great framing uh, presentation. Um, and I, I think it will link very nicely into the into the next presentation we have, which is uh, from uh, Eric Anderson, uh, who's representing the, the WMO expert, expert team on observing system design and utilization within the Infrastructure Commission. Um, Eric's going to talk about the uh, the rolling review rolling review requirements process, and uh, I'll hand uh, hand directly over to you, Eric. Uh, it's the same uh, same deal, uh, six six minutes, and I'll, I'll let you know when we're getting near the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Anthony, and thanks uh, thanks for having me in in this workshop. And I'm very pleased to be here <clears throat> to have the opportunity to present our rolling requirements review process that we run for uh, WMO. Um, the uh, talk, I think, what you will see in a moment that one of the key ingredients to this process is knowledge from observing system simulation experiments or observation impact experiments, as we heard about in the previous talk. The other uh, key ingredient is simply knowledge about what the observation requirements are for the various activities that WMO runs as its own program or supports, uh, whether it's in weather, uh, water, or climate. So when we're talking about the scope of my talk and the scope of the activity here, it's observations that are uh, needed to support uh, WMO activities and across all Earth system domains. And we can think of the RRR process really as a co-design uh, effort, uh, a co-design of um, WMO's integrated global observing system. Uh, it's important as well to, to realize that um, the process, you know, the setting out of the process and the drawing out of, of general recommendations, that's a, a top-down effort to establish the process, to run it, uh, to document it, to make it known. But the, uh, the information uh, that goes into it is not top down. That comes from um, the communities uh, that are involved in uh, forecasting, monitoring, and maintenance of, of observation networks uh, in all uh, Earth system domains, including the ocean. Uh, right, um, that was a long time on the first slide. Uh, I should mention the people I've been working with. Um, this work takes place within the joint expert team of the Earth Observation um, Observing System Design and Evolution that I'm chairing uh, with Seyun Park from Korea. Uh, our primary ocean expert in this team is Meredi Loa from Liège in Belgium. Uh, at the WMO Secretariat, it's Etienne Charpentier, uh, Alexander Scheidt, and also specifically on the work that I'm presenting here is Rosemary Monroe from uh, UMEDSAT and Jopen Dibben as a consultant working with WMO. So next slide, please. Um, this is what I've just said, uh, except that it's also clarifying more precisely what the purpose is of the work we're doing. So summarize the gaps identified in the current observing networks to uh, draw out priorities for action. Uh, and we're focused uh, on the five-year period indicated here, 23 to 27, and to state the principles that should, should be considered for, for the design, at, often at national level, uh, of the implementation plans for WIGOS. So that's the sort of co-design uh, principle. Uh, the scope is both in situ and space-based, and uh, it reflects the consensus view based on the information we gathered through the requirement um, uh, gathering process. And all of this has recently been written down in what we call a high level guidance document. It's aimed at WMO members, uh, anyone who's interested in learning about this co design effort uh, can access this document. It's going to be presented and hopefully approved by INFCOM 
uh, in the autumn. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, how is the ocean reflected in this document? I said that Vygos includes all uh, aspects of the Earth system. Uh, and obviously ocean is a, is a key part. And yes, uh, we have worked closely with the ocean community. We have had very good engagement from experts. We have an entire section on uh, observation gaps and statements on, on that effect in the, in the paper. We have inform gathered information on observation impact study results, um, as indicated here. We have uh, what's called a statement of guidance and observation applications. It's a few years old, but we have used it and we are taking steps on having that uh, updated. Next, please. Um, the RRR um, it, it consists in a database where we store the requirements as tables, essentially a spreadsheet of tables. Um, we uh, include in here, um, we supplement that or we contrast that with um, uh, knowledge of observation impact gathered at uh, WMO workshops that we run every four years. Um, and from that, we have experts analyze these data and provide statements of guidance, which are essentially gap analysis for each uh, activity area um, included in the process. Next, please. And um, for, um, we, we've recently gone through a process of updating the, the RRR itself. And you'll be pleased, I hope, to notice that, that we're putting a lot of effort uh, on including equally all the Earth system application categories as we can. Uh, space weather, atmosphere, ocean, hydrosphere, terrestrial and cryosphere. We're putting a lot of effort or increasing effort on documenting the requirements of observations in the physical interfaces, such as the interface between ocean and uh, atmosphere. We're seeking also to embed in the process collaboration between the application areas to, to capture what's, what's been discussed already in this workshop, that observations can be used for several purposes or can help satisfy observation needs across several activities that's important to capture. So the ocean community will be in the driving seat for this uh, when it comes to the uh, marine application part and potentially can define additional uh, sub-applications to provide uh, observation requirements for uh, as required now and in the future. For example, um, the focus on uh, coastal may need to be captured here uh, in the near future. Next, please. I'll have to ask you to hurry up for it. Yeah, I'm nearly there. So uh, the next big piece of work that we're doing is to uh, work on the Global Basic Observing Network, where we are uh, looking at expanding that from the current uh, frame, framework, which basically deals with the requirements for, at, for weather forecasting and for climate monitoring. And here, marine observations, in particular over the high seas, will be included. We can now skip uh, two slides. Uh, uh, back one. And uh, we are engaging. Uh, we had already very good engagement with uh, Goose, where uh, as you can see at the bottom here, John Turton, David Egler, and Emma Heslop have uh, gathered input in, from the observation coordination group on how they would like to see an expansion of GBON for uh, ocean observations. Uh, find the slide, please. Uh, yes, so uh, when it comes to our work and our reason for engaging with the ocean community, it's very strong. Firstly, and most uh, urgently for the GBON expansion that we're working on this autumn, uh, generally long-term for the extension of RRR, the Rural and Requirements Review for Marine Applications, and um, coordination of observation evaluation activities, such as Ocean Predict, and other efforts to evaluate um, the impact of ocean observations 
on ocean monitoring and forecasting applications themselves and on uh, their impact on climate monitoring and then NWP, for example. So thank you. That uh, concludes my presentation. Thank Over you. you yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Eric. Um, uh, you can nobody can see me. The host has disabled my video and must not have liked the, uh, the look of me. Uh, so I will uh, <laughs> thank. Thanks for that uh, that presentation, Eric. And I'm sure that will uh, will lead to some very interesting questions. And we uh, we have already some some good questions in the chat. Thanks. Uh, so uh, our next presenter and the, the last presenter for this uh, session is uh, Samantha Burgess, who's uh, speaking from the Copernicus Climate Change uh, Service. So uh, Samantha, it's over to you, and you have uh, you have six minutes, and then I'll just note that we will have uh, thirty minutes of of question and answer leading up to the break. Thank you, Samantha. Go ahead. Great, thank you, Anthony. And uh, Andrea, if you could jump directly to the second slide, that'd be fantastic. I think um, many of the concepts that I normally talk about when I introduce C3S are, are very familiar to this community. So um, the Copernicus Climate Change Service is one of the six Copernicus services that are funded by the EU. And we're, um, I guess, in the very lucky position that we're hosted by ECMWF. So we've been able to tap into not only the data assimilation community that ECMWF is intimately familiar with, but also the member states that make up the, the council of ECMWF are also, uh, the majority of them are also member states for the European Commission, which means we, uh, as a user-driven climate service, we directly uh, respond to their user requirements. So if you can, yeah, that's my perfect, thank you. So the uh, climate data store, which is kind of the central nexus of the climate data that C3S provides has only been operational since 2018. So in the short four years since it's been live, we have over 136,000 users and counting. Um, and the, the data that's available, uh, we give full traceability and transparency back to the source of that data. And we're using a range of different observations um, through different timescales for the climate system to attempt to make that data relevant to society, whether it's a decision maker, a business or an individual citizen. Next slide, please. And then if we talk about some of the highlights that C3S has achieved in its few short years, um, we have this extraordinarily large user base, and this equates to approximately half a million requests every single day for data. So, um, uh, and this is uh, broken down into over 120 different data sets. A, a recent example was the IPCC, the sixth assessment report where uh, ERA 5, our reanalysis um, uh, product was cited over 200 times. And the scientific paper that describes the background and, and the methodology behind ERA 5 has uh, close to 3,000 citations, and, and that's only been published, I think, um, uh, late 2020. So in under two years, it's, it's 3,000 citations and counting. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the data that we provide available, we're really attempting to be a one-stop shop of the type of climate data that you may need. So it's everything from observations to reanalysis in terms of the past, and then we go into climate predictions in the present, and of course, climate projections and the same climate projections that are used in the, the IPCC assessments as well. So, but obviously the climate uh, service community is incredibly diverse and, and moving very rapidly as well. One of the objectives of the program is to create business opportunities within the EU. So it's very much not about being able to deliver data for every different type of need that a business or an organization may have, but to enable those connections with downstream data services um, who have the ability to then tailor 
our data, whether it's reanalysis or whether it's climate projections, to the needs of that actual user, that sector, and, and what they need that data for. So we see it as very much a, a healthy ecosystem. And I guess going back to the questions that were posed uh, when I was putting this presentation together, that's one of the challenges that we have of, you know, we it is really hard to understand the absolute number of how many people use our data. We know we have the registered users, but the um, climate data store is also harvestable. So it, it's on Google Earth Engine, it's on the Amazon Data Cloud, and they're effectively super users where they download the data once, but they may have thousands or you know, even hundreds of thousands of users tapping into that data on those different platforms. So that's one of the challenges of questioning and, and answering the question of data value and data access is, you know, you kind of need to let it go and, and hope for the best and hope that you have some metrics in place that show the value add that you're providing and, you know, keep getting these examples back from the community of how reanalysis has been used, how climate projections have been used, and they've used the data from C3S, but it's really one of those challenges. And then next slide, please. So quickly going through observations, um, everyone on the call hopefully is intimately familiar with the climate system. So at the moment, we only have four uh, ocean essential uh, climate variables available. The ambition is to increase this with the next phase of uh, Copernicus, which will go through the, the next European funding framework, so up until 2027. And obviously, we work very closely with the ocean um, service as well that's hosted by Mercator and CMEMS. Uh, to really work together to make sure that we're answering those questions from the ocean community, as well as the climate community. Next slide, please. And for those who are unfamiliar with reanalysis, this is one of my favorite examples of really looking what we're trying to do. Very famous image on the left-hand side of the, the Earth from space taken from Apollo 17 in 1972. And on the right hand side is a, a recreation of that day using uh, era five reanalysis um, and the ECMWF model uh, initialized from era five. And you can see that we're close. Um, the, the large scale structure of the, the cloud dynamics is there, but clearly as scientists, we want to get closer and closer to the reality that we see. And this brings me to um, my final two slides. So in terms of the co-design process, I think you know six minutes really isn't any time at all to really talk about what, how you create a successful co-design process, but we did have the flexibility and budget available in the first phase of Copernicus to really look to different sectors and say, you know, how can we use this data that's meaningful for you? So one of the examples that we have available in the climate data store, so I'd encourage anyone interested to, to go check it out. Um, we've got a very robust user support service as well. So if you are interested in using our data, our data please get in touch. But this application was designed with um, marine spatial planning practitioners to facilitate access to and the ability to manipulate the ocean climate change modeling data sets available. Um, next slide, please. And when we talk about development into the future, um, the, the next generation of our global reanalysis will be ERA-6. So this will create even more robust maps without, without gaps. So our existing resolution is 31 kilometers and we'll be going down to 18 kilometers. The other really exciting development for ERA-6 is a coupled ocean. So as you can imagine, a coupled ocean and atmosphere will bring a lot of challenges in terms of the data assimilation. So in terms of the, the ocean data requirements that C3S needs, and I think arguably the climate community in general needs, is very much to maintain the existing observing platforms. And it was heartbreaking to hear some of the earlier uh, presentations where the, the float systems are at 10% capacity from where they used to be. We really need long-term records. And this means we also need to rescue uh, historical data as well so that we have this better understanding through time, particularly of extreme events in the ocean. We need to increase data over the polar regions, increase the accuracy and the quality of uh, SST, particularly in the tropics. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the importance of the tropics, and this is really a challenge for us in, in terms of being able to 
trust the data that comes out of era five from the tropics when when we're looking at the hydrological cycle in particular we we don't generally report on that region because we just know it, it's not good enough yet we also need near real-time availability of data which is critical for model initialization and of course increased characterization not only of the deep ocean but also of the boundary currents i'll leave it there hopefully i was on time and i look forward to answering any questions from the audience thank you very much Thanks very much, uh, Samantha, and, and some great, I think, some, some great messages uh, around uh, sustainability of observations at, at the end there as well, um, uh, which is, you know, equally as important as, uh, as, as finding, finding new ways of observing is, is maintaining what we already have and what we've had in the past. So we've had, uh, we've had quite a few questions uh, come in uh, through, through the, the chat uh, function and also through, through the Slack. So I'm just going to start uh, start going through them, and the first one I might uh, direct at least initially to uh, to Yosuke, and maybe Eric would have a perspective as well. The question is: Do we expect that OSE and OSSE type tools uh, will be developed to guide bio, bio yeah biochemical and or biological observations, and what evaluation approaches might be suitable for these types of observations? Um, uh, you, you're okay, I'm not going to use that way. Yeah, actually, there are a uh, bunch of uh, studies uh, studying the uh, impact of ocean colors and uh, algal flows, uh, synergy of ocean colors and bio algal flows, or, and, or another BGC observation. So, actually, there are many studies about the impact of the uh, biogeochemical stuff in the uh, ocean prediction and VGC prediction systems. But, uh, uh, you know, they are just uh, individual studies and, and uh, the, uh, the accuracy is maybe not enough. So, and so we need uh, more development and, uh, and also we need uh, coordination of uh, presenting the result to the public. So, and uh, Anyway, we we need to uh, advertise the result. We need to introduce the result to the public. Uh, I think it's the first way, and uh, I think there are uh, several uh, capacity to evaluate the impact of VGC observations. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Maybe just while we're on uh, the OSSEs, um, uh, maybe maybe this is for you, Eric, uh, given your background. But the question is, uh, given that OSSEs are expensive and we need more, will they be one of many tools or be a price worth paying for vital information? Or do we need more resources to make them more efficient? Uh, so it's really, yeah, a question of, you know, the, the, the I guess the cost benefit analysis of OSSEs really. And, Maybe to you, Eric. Yeah, I've been involved in uh, a couple of large scale uh, OSS. Oops, there was a bit of echo. Yeah, it, quite a few, a, quite a couple of um, large OSC efforts um, in my career. And it's true, it's a lot of um, human resource uh, effort involved, uh, first in setting it up and then to evaluate it. Um, there's also a lot of computing required. <clears throat> but even so, um, the the in, in a pure cost benefit analysis, I, I would I would think that in most cases, even the cost of an OSSC system would be uh, you know very very small and and, and, and very beneficial uh, compared to the cost of um, the observing systems themselves, um, both with. Uh, um, substantial uh, in situ observing systems and, and certainly for, for satellite systems. The challenge rather is um, to um, involve um, and connect um, with sufficient numbers of, of scientists and also to get the computing resources um, for the work. Um, I should also say that the, the results you get are quite dependent. I mean, they, they are they make more sense and are easier to interpret if the modeling system and the data assimilation systems are of are mature 
um, you know, good quality. If it's at an, at an early stage of model development and data simulation development, then the results you get uh, often tell you more about your modeling system than about the, the observations uh, as a caveat. Um, but still, I would certainly uh, promote the idea of uh, establishing OSSCs uh, wherever possible. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Um, I'm just just uh, just perhaps going through these questions here. There's some very interesting uh, threads here. I just want to kind of spread spread things around a little bit. So maybe a question to you, Samantha. Um, can you give an indication of the of the budget that Copernicus uh, C3S puts towards engagement with with stakeholders? Uh, so you you know what maybe some some kind of you know what are your user engagement type programs that you have? Thank you. Sure. So I um, saw the question, I had a smile, because sadly, um, we no longer have a specific budget for use cases and demo cases within um, the second phase of Copernicus. And the reason why this decision was made was the number of users that those use cases and demo cases were attracting. So the um, mechanism to engage with the user community in this second phase of, uh, of Copernicus is twofold. So it's by developing applications. So the developing an application is using um, climate data for a particular sector in uh, co-designed with that sector. And you can see a number of examples that we have available in the CDS. And the hope is by um, improving the co-design process, we will increase the user base to do that. The second mechanism that we're using to engage with uh, different users more is to develop uh, memorandums of understanding where we have ways of working with particular sectors. So a recent example that we've developed is with the European Investment Bank, where, as you can imagine, for them to um, be able to assess any of their projects, they need to understand the, the future climate impacts of those projects. So how do we package the climate data in such a way that is meaningful to EIB and hopefully other international banks at the same time without going uh, too far downstream of the, the types of products and the family of products that we have to make sure that we're not cutting off other um, players within the climate service ecosystem. I think you're muted, Anthony. Oh, thanks, thanks, Samantha. You think I would have learned after uh, so many uh, years of, of dealing with this? Uh, and thank you very much. Um, so we have probably more questions that we can get through in the available time. Um, if I go back to the, there were a lot of questions about OSSEs and OSEs. So this might be a question back to you, Yasuke. The uh, OSSEs and OSEs address mainly global, ocean or regional climate, uh, seasonal to seasonal assessments. And the question says that they're not yet looking at more regional questions and requirements. Uh, also, the applications limited mostly to physical variables. So how can we kind of step up in, in these activities and kind of lift it, lift it to the next level? And maybe this might be uh, also an opportunity to talk about whether there's new approaches like artificial intelligence or something that we can use in this area. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Of course, yeah, there are many OSSEs for global ocean, but also regional OSSE is conducted by some regional centers or regional models and. Uh, at, yeah, in, for example, we we introduced some of the regional activity in the uh, Ocean of White Paper and also the uh, special issue of Ocean Predict and uh, not Ocean Predict, but I Ocean View. And uh, so, but uh, yeah, we have we need to coordinate the result to appeal the in, in importance of observation data. And uh, yeah. We, we didn't do that well, but in Shinobus, we would like to coordinate well the results and appeal the stakeholder to the impact of observations more effectively. I, I want, and uh, am I answering your question? I'm not sure. 
Yes, I, I, I think so. The question was, you know, how, do, how does the, the, the current framework of OSSEs and, and OSEs need to evolve uh, to take into account new data types, new oh. requirements, but also maybe some new opportunities from things like... Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to, to say, so the, we, we do many, many OSE or OSSE and also evaluation of impact by a joint or as a method, but the interpretation is important to appeal the result, and we need to improve the interpretation. I think, yeah. Thanks, 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 uh, thanks very much. Uh, yes, okay. So, so we're just I'm just working my way through here. Uh, I think this one could could go to you, Eric. Um, so the question is. How do we incorporate the role of seasonal and interannual forecasts such as ENSO as an important role for atmospheric predictions? And I guess in terms of in terms of understanding observational requirements. And the question says, and I know you'll want to respond to this, the question says the present draft of the Triple R document focuses on short-term forecasts. So maybe Eric, you'd want to talk about the, the breadth of the of the role in review. Um Right. Um, I don't know where to start. Um, um, okay, we can t uh, maybe start with the observation impact. And I have, um, uh, as I said, every four years we run a, a workshop dedicated to observation impact. Uh, it has tended to be quite uh, NWP focused, but each year we have, or each time, uh, we have uh, really tried uh, to promote the idea of doing impact studies also for longer term forecasting. Um, we, 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 know, we know that there is a predictive skill uh, for seasonal forecasting from, from the ocean, from the land surface, from soil moisture, but particularly from the ocean. Um, we haven't had much of results presented of those workshops yet, but I think it's absolutely possible to do this. It may have been done elsewhere, and I'm not aware. Uh, but such results would be uh, very important to incorporate and reflect uh, within the uh, RRR process. Uh, when you say that the RRR focuses on short term, it's maybe because of the application areas that we have listed currently for ocean. This can change. It's really up to the communities to uh, determine which uh, application areas are relevant to them and that they want to uh, support within RRR. Um, beyond that, we have an application area for long range forecasting that's well established and it includes a chapter on the needs for observation in the ocean to support seasonal forecasting activities um, generally. Um, so uh, it's not it's not right to say that it's or are generally focused on mainly on short range. Um, it's just that perhaps it's more challenging to gather the information for uh, longer range forecasting. There would also be interesting to know about impact in climate, um, certain so climate applications on um, on uh, observations uh, to a large extent. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Eric. So yeah, I guess just responding to that question a little bit, you know, the, the rolling review of requirements does does include things like uh, climate climate science um, and and so on. So it, it, there is, even though it's not specifically within the ocean uh, application area, there, there's a there is a broader kind of time uh, range of time scales there. Um, there's a question. It's maybe slight, a slight tangent, um, but uh, maybe maybe a question to you, Samantha. Given given your comments about the need for historical data, and I think when we're talking about requirements, it's not just the here and now. You know, we often uh, you know with with, with the, the the growth of, of reanalysis products and the need to understand the past. Of course, uh, historical data is is equally important. So the question is that when it comes to data rescue and, and validation of products. Uh, what? How much of the contribution is from from uh, developing countries and, and the global south? 
Yeah, so it, it is a constant challenge. I think, um, you know, one of the, the legacies of the um, colonial, colonialization era and whaling and that kind of thing is the, you know, the international shipping did take very good records. So, so we do have excellent ship records, many of which still haven't been transcribed. Uh, there are also a lot of local navies in um, uh, the global south and in uh, small island states that also take excellent measurements. And, and part of uh, data rescue is, is at this stage still incredibly opportunistic of uh, meeting the right person, recognizing that there is a room full of logbooks that have been gathering dust for decades and actually having a bit of budget to digitize those logbooks before they get thrown in a skip or, or burnt or whatever it may be. And I think, you know, this is, we, we've seen so many fantastic examples of engaging society through citizen science projects where you can easily gamify the, um, uh, the transcribing of these data records. And there's been some incredibly successful examples of that with Galaxy Zoo. I think um, the, the biodiversity community is also getting involved with this in terms of looking at uh, polar colonies of, um, you know, maybe it's walruses in the northern hemisphere and, and penguins in the southern hemisphere, but using ESA satellite photos, et cetera, et cetera, to, to really look at population dynamics. So looking at those opportunities for co-design and, and for engaging communities that aren't normally engaged is incredibly important and can be incredibly rewarding. But equally, the short answer to that question is, we don't have nearly as much data from the Global South as we would like to have. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Samantha. So it's still a bit of a challenge out there for us. And in some, in some cases, it's often, uh, as Samantha says, a, a race against time to ensure that, uh, that we get to these records before uh, some kind of uh, physical, uh, physical destruction uh, occurs. Um, we've got a couple more questions, and I'm uh, I'm kind of looking at the chairs where we are. We have got another another ten minutes or so before the break, so I I, I feel like I have the latitude to continue the conversation. Um, and uh, these questions, some of these are maybe uh, once again a little bit kind of related to the area of requirements, but uh, given that we've got such a such a high profile and high, uh, capable panel. Um, happy to happy to throw these questions to you. So uh, one is that, and maybe I'll, I'll open it up to anyone uh, to answer this one, but uh, the data assimilation systems, and we've heard a little bit before uh, from the first session about, you know, data requirements are often being expressed for the outputs of data assimilation systems rather than right back for the observations themselves. Uh, it's true in reanalysis, it's maybe equally true in, in weather forecasting to some degree and probably for ocean modelling as well. So do data assimilation systems themselves need to evolve in order to effectively utilise new observation systems like never before? So I'll just throw that to the panel. So you are asking the data assimilation system itself should be evolved yeah. according to the, yeah. Yeah, I think so. You know, we will have a SWOT. It's very exciting. So, but uh, in order to assimilate SWOT, we need to develop a new data assimilation technology and we need to know the uh, property of errors. And uh, so, so we need to evolve, uh, data assimilation system should be evolved for SWOT. And also now many centers developing the couple data assimilation systems, you know, if we use couple data assimilation system, we can assimilate the uh, uh, observations of uh, planetary boundary layers more effectively, we believe. And But uh, in order to do that, we need to uh, develop new methods to assimilate those data. So, and also sea ice, you know, we are now uh, assimilating sea ice concentration ordinary, but uh, sea ice thickness or uh, the uh, ve vector uh, velocity of sea ice is also, uh, we can assimilate. So uh, we need to develop more and more to improve data assimilation systems, I think. Okay. Thanks very much. 
Uh, yeah, I think, sorry, jumping in from my side, you know, I, I'm sure this answer depends on who you ask, whether they're from the observation community or the data assimilation community. And, and the reality is the, the more observations we have, the more accurate we hope the, the models will become because they're assimilating those observations. I think it is very easy to be enthusiastic and excited about the potential for AI and machine learning to develop ever more complex and uh, high resolution models of our Earth system. But unless we actually understand the, the physics and understand the feedback mechanisms then and, and understand whether that model is correct or not, then you know having that level of resolution doesn't actually help us answer fundamental questions. And I think the, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation is a really nice example of this, that if you take you know, 10 different ocean reanalyses, you might get a different answer on the AMOC and, and we don't know which one is right. Um, so, so how do we place that trust in what the reanalysis is telling us without those additional observations of the complexity of the AMOC? Thank you, thank you, Samantha. Um, Eric, I'm not sure if you want to comment on this. Uh, otherwise, I can. Uh, uh, my, my comment would be that uh, you know, the question was about additional observations that may um, trigger or require additional development. Uh, but I think we've heard from the answers already uh, that it's not only that. It's because we are working with uh, system models now that observations that previously uh, well, are not new but because they exist on the interface, for instance, between the ocean and the atmosphere, um, new, that their, their use becomes much more pertinent uh, and requires uh, develop, careful development of, um, of the data simulation system and the modeling system to correctly handle the information and spread it both within the atmosphere and the, within the ocean in a consistent manner so that the information is, uh, is retained in the modeling system for longer and gets a, a consistent response across uh, this physical interface. And I know that uh, you know, this, this is an area of, of uh, research and development uh, in the simulation at present. Well, well thanks, uh, thanks very, very much. I think we've got, we've got one more question that's come in that I think will, will really help us to, to kind of summarize uh, the, the discussions and, and bring, us to a, bring us to a close. I think what, what I've seen from the presentations is we started off with a, with a very kind of technical focus, you know, looking at really the science and how that can inform uh, our understanding of, of, of requirements and the understanding of in, impacts of observations. We've then seen from, from, from the WMO perspective, a bit more of a process driven view about how this can be done. And then I think finally, we've seen that kind of last leg with the real connection directly to, to the user community through uh, C3S. So the, the, the last question, and I'll invite each of the panelists in turn to, to have a go at, uh, at, at, at commenting on this. So how should we organize efficiently the discussions within the co-design program and exemplars, the OSEs, the OSSEs, and the AI evaluations across domains, so ocean physics, biochemistry, biology, and the atmosphere, and across scales, and while continuing to dialogue with uh, end users, so any any thoughts on just how we might we might uh, we might take this uh, this forward? And I'll I'll just go to each of you in turn. So Yusuke, I know it's a tough question, uh, but it, just in any any final comments or in, indeed any final comments on the session at all. Thanks. Yeah, it's a tough question, I think. Yeah, but Ocean Predict and Shinobus try to introduce our ability and the result of OSE to the uh, observational committee and to the public and to the stakeholders. And also we will make the report on the impact of, we try to make the report on the impact of ocean observations. And we need, we, we try to in, uh, increase the communication with the uh, observational committee and also stakeholders. And also we, we uh, support the uh, ocean, ocean observing co-design. And uh, yeah, so 
Yeah, I don't have a clear answer, but we would like to increase the collaboration and we enhance the collaboration. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not a good answer, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go, I'll go to you, Eric, please. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this this was really the what I tried to focus on in in my talk is to um, sketch um, the process um, that WMO has put in place and has been running successfully for 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 more than a decade. Um, and the purpose of it is to engage um, across um, and and pro across the all the activity areas of WMO. Uh, and uh, provide a, a framework for co-design uh, of an evolution of, of observing system. Um, and we, uh, and I, I really uh, think, and I really hope as well that that framework will continue to be seen as useful and relevant for the ocean community and particularly for the projects that we're discussing here. Uh, and that you can provide uh, information to, to RRR and vice versa and that this will be beneficial for for um, for your work and and our work. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank many of you on online that have already been contributing very very substantially to to that, and and hopefully have benefited from from working with the RRR process uh, recently and in the past. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Cement. I think my answer will probably deviate um, quite markedly from, from the other two panellists, which were both incredibly valuable contributions. Um, before I joined C3S, my um, background was in ocean policy based in Brussels. And I think the, the ocean still suffers a, a crisis of confidence, if you will, of um, you know, the, the importance of the ocean to the climate system is still not well recognized. And until broader society recognizes why ocean data is so important, we're going to suffer from the, the budget limitations that we suffer from to maintain these observing systems. And, you know, satellites can only get us so far, although the, the satellite infrastructure is improving all the time, we really need those in situ observations as well. So how do we mainstream the value add that ocean data brings? And I think the, the UN Ocean Conference in this month in uh, Portugal is a great step. I, th I think there are a lot of lessons learned from the, um, the census of marine life as well, which had an enormous philanthropic sponsor and did a huge amount for ocean science over that decade. So how, how can we collectively increase the value add of ocean observations to broader society? And then once it is mainstreamed, hopefully that will mean uh, connections will develop in terms of co-design, in terms of countries that aren't normally interested in ocean observations will see the value add. And, and hopefully that will mean the policy uh, and decision makers will also see the importance of improving and maintaining an ocean observ observation network. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Samantha, and I, I, I see that as a, a complimentary message, actually. So I, I think that within the community, it's really important that we, we have a dialogue and the dialogue is informed by, by science. And, and what's clear also out of this discussion, I think, is that the data assimilation community play a, a really important role in terms of bridging between uh, the, the operators of observing systems and, and the end users. I think your message is a really important one as well, that, that if we just talk amongst ourselves, we, <laughs> we, uh, we kind of maintain the status quo, but you know, it will be an important message at the UN Ocean Conference and at the COP later this year, you know, the, the, the sustainability of, of ocean observations and the need for ongoing uh, program funding uh, for, for, for core observational programs for the, for the good well-being of the, of, the, of the planet and the understanding of the climate system. So thanks uh, very much uh, to, to our three panellists today. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, that brings us right on time. And I'll, I'll hand back to, uh, to David and, and Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
three panelists. Uh, it was really a great discussion and great presentation. So we will come back to you with, uh, with some work probably uh, we can uh, organize together. So now uh, we, we have 15 minutes break and uh, we resume uh, at uh, 8, uh, 24, 25, well, it's uh, 8 here, but uh, I, don't, I don't remember which time, uh, yeah, 12, 24, thanks for my read. So see you then and uh, uh, we will continue our, our session.
Sahara. Okay. Hello, uh, everyone. You. We are back. So we uh, we are now continuing our workshop day one, and uh, we have a uh, session three, uh, and we'll focus on stakeholder engagement with some examples of successes. So this uh, session will be moderated by Michel, Michel Heupel. I must with um, insight from herself and an uh, example from IMOS, then uh, Jan Newton and Vivian so uh, Solis Rivera. One is uh, from uh, the US Integration Ocean of Service System, IOS, and uh, Vivian will talk about Conf Solidar from Costa Rica. Thank you. Michelle, it's up to you. Are you there? Yeah, I see you. I am. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, just briefly, I guess, you know, what we're going to try to do in this session is talk about the importance of stakeholder engagement. We want to have a bit more of a panel. Um, so we'll give each give a, a few very brief slides and then we'll open it up for discussion. I think we've already heard this morning, there are a range of different definitions of stakeholder, uh, which is something we, we need to keep in mind as we work through this. But the bottom line is, regardless of what our definitions are, effective engagement with those stakeholders is really critical to the success of our observing programs, but also, um, you know, functioning in a true co-design um, sort of approach. So Andrea is going to be helping me out here um, with things. So if, if she can put my slides up would be fantastic. And then um, I think we'll just go through the order that we are on the agenda. So I'll go first and then we'll go to Jan and then to Vivian. Thanks very much. You can um, go ahead and go on to the to the next slide, please. So just briefly, IMOS really takes an approach where we try to work um, what I would describe as end to end. So at the top of, on this diagram, you can see that you know our program is designed around five areas of societal benefit that we try to work towards and, and inform. And then we also have three areas of um, research themes where we cluster those um, areas of societal benefit up. So things around climate change, ocean health and generation of knowledge, operational services. But all of that is really underpinned by the layer that's at the bottom. And that's engaging with, in our case, um, nodes and jurisdictions. So groups around the country who, who are working with, with end users and stakeholders through our research partnership. So IMOS is, is a joint venture program. So we are a big partnership. So hearing from our partners and working with them. We also have partnerships with modeling um, groups. Some of those are formalized. Some of those are, are less formalized research groups, but working with them to understand the needs to underpin their models is critical. And then finally, we have a, a range of operational partnerships, whether that be with the Navy, um, fisheries or oil and gas industry. So we're working to engage across all of these sectors, including research and science um, members of the community, identify their needs, um, and figuring out where our observations can contribute to meet their needs, partnering wherever we can, and delivering things that, in a way that we think and hope we can um, create real-world applications and deliver societal benefit. Next slide, please. This slide to me is, is a little bit um, backwards, I'm going to work from the right hand side um, across to the left. And this is how we think about um, our program and planning for use and impact. We start off with what the needs are on here on the right hand side. So we know that, that our farmers need, you know, long to meet, medium to long range weather forecasts. So how can we help inform that? We know that maritime industries need operational ocean forecasts. How can we inform that? We also have sea level rise um, and inundation issues coming for our future. So taking those needs and then working back through our areas of societal benefit and our research themes, what tools do we have in our toolbox that we can apply to help answer those questions? So, you know, is it is it something that we can um, deploy Argo floats to help address? Is it satellite remote sensing work? Is it wave boys? What are the things that we could bring to the community to help address these issues? So it's really about moving from the use and impact from our program being something that we hope comes out of what we what we plan to do and actually planning 
um, to meet the needs of, of the, the people in our community and measuring ourselves against uh, whether we're delivering that. And I'll go to the last slide, please. So I think measuring ourselves against what we're trying to achieve is a really important part of what we need to do um, in, in our program. So here we've got our areas of societal benefit around uh, marine sovereignty and security, food and energy security, biodiversity conservation, and coastal populations. And the color of the boxes here indicate how strongly um, each of these things um, aligns with those priority areas. These are just a few examples. So the top row there being Argo floats and how IMOS is using Argo floats um, in across our areas of societal benefit. This is a, is a ground truth for us, whether we're delivering what we, um, what we intend to and, and where we can grow and improve. So it, it's now a fundamental part of our program to take these reviews and look back. And I think that also gives us another opportunity to loop back and discuss with the stakeholders whether we're meeting their needs and, and how we can go forward um, to, to better meet their needs in the future. So that's kind of a nutshell of how IMOS approaches um, some of this stakeholder engagement and, and co-design. And I will leave you there and hand over to Jan, please. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, first, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to talk to you today and, uh, and thank Andrea for uh, queuing up my slides. So I'm Jan Newton. I am the executive director of a regional ocean observing system called NANUS, which is part of the United States IUS. And so um, much like IMOS, IUS has at its heart the uh, um, service of the end-to-end -end service of uh, making sure that ocean observing data reaches users. And I put this figure um, that's a beautiful, I guess it's a little fuzzy and I apologize for that. It's from a paper by Melissa Iwamoto and co-authors that was written for um, Ocean OBS 19. And uh, um, it's in Frontiers Marine Science. And it's really showing this iterative feedback loop in terms of engaging with users. And so I use regional associations. There are 11 throughout the nation of the US um, work iteratively with users. And, and I think the point that I wanna make here is that as I go through these steps, co-design requires time. It, it really does, um, time to develop the trust, the mutual understanding, the needs and capabilities. But in the end, you are going to make that end-to-end -end value chain, if you will, work. And, and your connection and your um, usage of the information will hit target to help people make better informed decisions. So um, these steps are not meant to be sequential, but they describe three important facets of engaging with stakeholders. One is to tailor engagement to identify user needs. And so that means that you need to know those needs. And so if you click once, um, Andrea, you'll see a, a, a product that we made in Nanus, um, which is uh, optimized for tuna fishers. Tuna are caught in waters when it's above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Not Celsius. They don't use those units. And usually scientists have the nice rainbow colors. But we worked with the um, tuna fishing community on um, the coastline, which is a fairly rural coastline. And this supplies a lot of jobs, um, smaller um, operations. And now here is a forecast model that's optimized for finding what they call tuna water, the red water. And it helps people um, plot. And also you see the currents. And, and so you plot safe and effective um, outings. Um, so understanding needs, building relationships, attending each other's meetings. Next step is to design and refine the data products with users. Thank you. And, and so this is another um, forecast model. This is a seasonal model, um, Samantha Sidlecki's J-Scope product, and it's showing where hypoxia is. And so in this case, it wasn't just agreeing on what color you know, worked and, and purple, purple said low oxygen, but it was also understanding the depth contour and, and iteratively figuring out 
what scale um, people needed the information at. So you can't really tell it, but this is a product that had several renditions before it reached this, this, um, this level. And so in that process that it is an iterative loop. Um, and, and then the last step on here is to continue that iterative engagement, but to build trust. And so here is a picture of where, again, that same JSCOPE model was compared to data um, that's taken by the sanctuary, the National Marine Sanctuary, and the managers use that, those data. They, they trust those data. Those data have been out there for a long time. And so comparing the model to the data that they trust really went a long way toward um, building that reliance and then evaluating the model when it doesn't do so well and trying to understand what is, was involved. So I really encourage you to um, check out this paper by Iwamoto et al. It's very rich. Um, it was led by IUS directors, but there's a lot of other examples in there. And I feel it has a lot of key messages for how to go about engaging with stakeholders. So that's a, an example on national scale. I wanted to um, give you another example. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a project that I have um, that was funded through um, the U.S.'s NOAA um, Ocean Acidification Program. They funded regional vulnerability assessments, which were very place-based. But um, in this one occurred on the Olympic coast of Washington State, pretty remote. It's home to four treaty tribes, as well as a sanctuary and a national park. But what was exciting about this is really putting because it was a social ecological system approach, putting humans into the, the picture, right? When I think of an ecosystem, I don't usually have humans in there, but they of course are. And so the next slide shows a process that um, I and my co-PI, Melissa Poe, who is a social scientist developed, and it's a little busy here, but what I wanna show you is that each of these little circles, the one on the top, scope, local risk, environment, and priority needs. Um, the green is the, the um, activities that the natural scientists and the social scientists did together. The blue ones are where the social science team worked. And then the orange ones are where the oceanographers and the biologists worked. And so we were really trying to understand vulnerability to ocean acidification, but the social scientists in that step two, it's kind of at one o'clock there, understand social importance of marine species and role in well-being. So because they did that work, then as we took our next three steps, um, me being an oceanographer, to analyze the variability in the data, to work with uh, Samantha Sedlecki's um, projection of ocean conditions out to the end of the century, and then to assess the frequency and duration and location of harmful events. If you, all you are doing are those three steps, you're gonna end up with this huge amount of data and information. But because then the social scientists had done their work, we were able to evaluate risks to the ecosystem that were important to the community partners. And the rest of the wheel is just how that's going to be implemented. But if we click to the next slide. So now what we've been able to do is for each of the species with a little yellow circle around them, razor clams versus salmon versus halibut, crab, um, mussels, is to develop when in the year is the um, species like say most susceptible to hazardous conditions. So for a razor clam, that's a ragonite saturation state and they spawn in April and May. And for other things, it's very different. But now we're able to develop these species stories working with the tribes so that they um, get the, the knowledge that then is something that they can plan around and, and, and be better informed. So that's on a very local level. And the last thing I wanna say, next slide, is I'm involved with another program, um, ORS, which is the Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability a program of the United Nations Ocean Decade for Ocean Science um, for Sustainability. Uh, this is a UN program that the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network put forward. 
And Go On was really set up to be, you know, kind of like grassroots, helping science do better ocean observing with respect to OA. So it was kind of more science for scientists to, to help us coordinate. But the payoff, of course, would be to society. ORS is helping us really make those connections. And if you look at those seven boxes across the bottom, it's a little hard to maybe interpret too much. And I encourage you to follow the URL and you'll see more um, information there. But you can see that there's a lot of um, people in their communication policy and, and what we're really trying to do by establishment of co-champions who take each one of these seven outcomes is connecting the people, be they scientists or policymakers, et cetera, to understand how we can better make progress in each of these seven necessary outcomes. So I wanted just to give you examples from IUS on a national scale, from a very local program, and then to a very global program, because they're all a little different, but the key is really taking the time to engage, thinking about where we want to get to, and be very intentional about it. And I think that's the thing, we don't budget time or money for that engagement, and it is really important. So with that, I'll say thank you and turn over the baton. Great, thanks very much, Jen. And um, now we'll move over to Vivian. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I am talking from Costa Rica and um, I've been very interested in the last hours. It's 6 a.m. here, 6.30. So I've been up from since 4 a.m. and it has been very interesting to listen and uh, learn from all of you and your presentation. So thank you very much for the organizers for having our voice here. And um, the idea is to um, analyze from our perspective, we are a cooperative that works with marine conservation and uh, human rights. And we have been working in Mesoamerica with small scale fisheries, especially. So when, when I heard uh, about uh, the co-design process, we looked at the definition that we all have in the, in the main documents and it talks about engaging users and stakeholders. But here we, we really think that there's a big need to discuss the difference between a stakeholder and a right holder. And this is key for us because for us, the right holder is an indigenous people or a small scale fishing community that has a right to tenure and to the access to these marine resources. And this is key because if we are going to move from local to regional, national and global scales, we really need to consider the different interests of different sectors towards a common objective, which will be the sustainable use of those resources of the sea. So um, we are going to have to look at particular interests or particular priorities in these territories. And this is a little bit of what I want to talk to you about this morning. By the way, the picture is Araceli, a women and mothers gatherer from the Pacific of Costa Rica. And she's also a very well-known feature in her community. Next, please, Andrea, thank you. So what is our context? <clears throat> the first thing is that in our case, we really need to recognize the, a rights-based approach to marine conservation. Most indigenous people and local communities do not have a formal access to tenure and to marine resources. What does that mean? That means that in the case of Costa Rica, for example, eight of every 10 small scale fishers do not have a formal um, permit to access the sea resources. They are informal. And this happens in our case because no information concerning the sustainability of, of the species they're using, nor the ecosystem use is available. So this is a key issue when we are talking about this co-design issue. Can we really work together to have the right information for governments to provide the access to these resources to the right holders, to these people that are need really to exercise a right? The second issue is the need for pre, free, previous, and informed consent and the recognition of governance models that are shared. That means that we have a co-management of the fishery and also managed by the sovereignty of indigenous people. 
So most marine protected areas are now under governance of the governments, but this is new. Before that, indigenous people, especially in Mesoamerica, for example, took decisions on most of the activities that happen in these areas. So we have very good examples of shared governance and also indigenous people governance of these territories where the issue of information is something very important for them for making decisions on what to do with these resources. The next one, please. So when we're talking about co-designing, uh, we believe that we really need we need to characterize this biodiversity, and this requires knowledge. But from a field, a territorial perspective, this knowledge can come from two sources. One is science, as we normally have heard, very important ways in which we can make sea observations, um, uh, information systems, research but also knowledge that can come from traditional knowledge. And this is an experience from living next to the coast. So this co-design process has to really base itself in knowledge gathering about the ocean. And this will bring in some of these right holders that can have a lot of knowledge by their own of all these years previous to our existence where these um, ecosystems were being managed. Next, please. So for us, working in marine conservation and human rights, we really urge a roadmap for more, more equitable and knowledgeable learning about the ocean and its people. Uh, we urge to look for a sea that unifies what we do and not separate it. Sometimes science can be so complicated, social science too that we, instead of getting united, we really get divided. And this is what's really happening at the moment in mo most of these territories. The government is saying, unless you bring in true science, we are not going to let exercise these human rights. And that is not the right way of really conserving the ocean. So we urge for the sustainable, equitable, and fair use of these resources, but we need to know that it is really not happening. And along these years where we have been providing of all this data about the ocean in the territories, the marine resources are, have been damaged and are not being able now to sustain most of these right holders that they hold in the past. The next one, please. So what are the priorities of these right holders of the sea? And we don't need more research to do this. We already know that there are issues related to tenure and access rights. Most of these communities do not have the access rights to use the resources. We need to be conscious of the needed free, previous and informed consent, very especially in the areas and territories where indigenous uh, peoples lived. We need decent work and for decent work that has to do with social justice and fair markets, formality is a key issue. And this formality is not provided to the fishers because the information is not there to guarantee sustainable use of resources. And the fourth is the value of women's work along the, the fisheries value chains, which is something very important. I was very happy to see all this um, women scientists uh, speaking a few minutes ago, but also in the fisheries world, you know, small scale fisheries need women along the value chains and they're key important players and right holders in this whole picture. Uh, the next one, please. We must add then that we already know that we need to secure preferential access to small scale fisheries and we need to co-manage 100% of coastal territories with the active participation in decision-making of these right holders. So we already know that's needed and we need the information that backs this up, the knowledge that backs this up so we can move ahead faster in solving the biodiversity issues, but also solving the cultural resilience needed for maintaining the sustainability of the oceans at the local and national level. We need to protect small scale fisher communities from blue economy traditional industries and processes. This is very important because if we use stakeholders as a general concept for the co-design, 
we will be bringing in all the other economic interests into the discussion that are not a primary right holder of those resources. And we need to take care that these more sustainable ways of using the resources can be maintained. And finally, we really need to build resilient um, small scale fishing communities to climate change and other climatic and environmental challenges, because at the end, they are the ones who are responding for the, the non capacity of the society to respond to these new challenges of climate change. Next one, please. So um, my last slide brings in the challenges and I would hope that tomorrow we would have the time to really talk about each one of these and be able to discuss within ourselves how we can really confront these challenges with hope. First, we have some conceptual challenges, and this is important. We really need to break the way we're doing things to bring in new ideas and new thoughts that could provide the basis for a new uh, society looking at the ocean. First, it has to do with the exercise of human rights of indigenous people in local communities, and particularly women versus participation. So it is not only to bring them in, it is to respect their rights. And that's a different relationship with these stakeholders. The second one, conceptual, is the difference between an environmental service versus an ecosystem approach. We cannot look at the ocean only as an economic area where we're gonna gather richness. It is an integral holistic approach that it's needed because the communities living there, they are not only acquiring an economic benefit from the ocean, but also culture, also food, as has been mentioned also before me. And finally, a blue growth versus a local economy, a sustainable local economy. That means it's not the ocean for others, but the oceans for each one of us. The second issue are the challenges that are in a methodological perspective. So how are we going to do the free previous informed consent? Thousands of hours in the Convention of Biological Diversity in the SDG 14 discussions are going towards the needed free previous informed consent that needs to be dealt with when we approach the territories of indigenous people. How are we going to implement that? What about a special planning and make it a really participatory and equitable? Um, the ecosystem approach versus this environmental um, considerations and how can we really have a broader view in the way that we approach these territories and sustainable use versus preservation. We need this very much at the territorial level, not only talking about preserving these resources, but using them sustainably, managing the resources. So we need to move a step um, ahead. Finally, the idea of the new challenges, there's some practical facts here. Um, let's talk about the 30 times 30. I'm um, telling you the example of Costa Rica, where eight of every 10 small scale fishers are non-formal because we lack the information to uh, provide this right um, implementation. But then you, the government comes with the idea of a 30 times 30, and guess who are the illegal fishers in these areas, right? The small scale fishers. So these are the fleets that are really in vulnerable situation at the moment and receiving the impacts of the other bigger fleets that do have their permits in hand to move towards the coast, coast because of this 30 times 30. The I, same I'm happens- Vivian, sorry to yes. interrupt you, but um, are you about to wrap up? We need to squeeze a couple of questions yes. and we really two, have two a few minutes left. Just to think. Think about other effective area-based conservation measures also has to respect the um, uh, sovereignty of indigenous people and the global biodiversity framework from the CBD that it's talking now about this issue. So how are we facing this? Are we only interested in the economic aspects of the ocean or not? It needs more effort, yes. It needs more time, yes. But it's the only way that we will be moving away from business as usual, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to, to both um, Vivian and Jam for the presentations. 
I have a couple of questions here um, coming in through the Slack. So um, the first one is to me about how IMOS engages with traditional populations to have their interests and world worldview represented. Um, and if care principles are taken into consideration, um, we certainly are engaging with traditional owners in Australia. We operate on their sea country uh, regularly. And we're in the process of looking at our forward funding and our forward program. And one of the things that we're looking at now is whether we can bring in an element of sea country observing where we hear directly from the traditional owners what observing they would like to help manage their sea country and find ways to um, sort of match them with scientists who can help deliver that information to inform their, their cultural understanding of, of their sea country, but also inform the observing so that we can provide information back to them and, and create a, a circular sort of um, approach. So that's a quick one for me. The, the next one is about um, that we heard in the last session about the value of design tools. And I think I'll, I'll start with Jan and then move on to Vivian. What kinds of tools and practices are being used to directly engage users on evaluating the uptake and applicability of ocean knowledge? So based on observations and model, models, um, is, is all of this qualitative work or is, or is it based on engagement and dialogue? How are you, um, what sort of tools and practices are you using? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Thank you, Michelle. Um, lots of different strategies. Uh, you know, one thing that we, we really work on with NANUS in terms of our ocean observing system and getting data into the hands of users in a way that's usable um, is, uh, first of all, figuring out a topical group, whether that's coastal resource managers from states and tribes, or whether that's surfers or tuna fishers or whoever, but to start with a group of trusted individuals that you can start to make that relationship with and have the dialogue. What information do you want? You know, what time scales? What, it, what are important decisions that you need to make? And then to co-design the products together and to, and to really be committed to that. And as I mentioned, that, that does take time. So one tool we use are, are working groups, you know, little um, uh, small groups that you gin up and then, and then can expand. Um, in terms of metrics, you know, one of the things that we often do is, is send out, we just had a, Nanu's had a community workshop so we had um, these user surveys that we sent out to the, to the community asking for individual bits, like, you know, what part of this do you like? What part could be improved? And so, so trying to get some metrics and feedback quantitatively in terms of people's usage. Um, and then, you know, we, we see when a product is used a lot versus when there just aren't that many hits on it. So then you have to think, is it because it's a bad product? because the word isn't getting out there. So I, I'll do my best to answer that very succinctly because it's a big question, but thank you. Thanks, Jen. Vivian? Yes, thank you. Um, we talked about knowledge and the first thing we do is really to try to respect and recognize the knowledge that these communities have in their territory and the, and the resources they used. So we ask for their permission for using this knowledge to join with ours in the scientific uh, world to start gathering information about their territory. And this information is going to be based on ethical values and principles brought back to them for a better management of those resources. So it depends on the species that are being used in the case of mollusk or fishing, it's a different way. In the case of mollusk gathering, there are different users according to the different um, species that they have. In some areas, they're close to 10 different resources that can be used. So we set up groups concerning the knowledge of the people so they can start sharing this. We also do a lot of participatory mapping. That means sitting down with the different men and women to discuss where do they uh, use these resources? Where are they located? Where do they see um, uh, organisms that are in the reproduction rate? Or we start discussing with the small scale fishers, what are the different species that they use? When are they brought to the gathering center? What are they selling the most in which months? And we start developing um, 
like mapping this qualitative information and then moving it to become quantitative. And then we can add some research, particularly on important issues that we are discovering with them. I think there are two key issues here. The one is coming back with the information to the right holders and then using this information for fighting for their rights. That means that research is not in itself, but it is for a reason. And we work with these communities towards really strengthening the rights um, uh, of these communities and also working with them to look for a sustainable use of those resources in the long term. That's fantastic. Um, thanks very much. I think um, I haven't seen David and um, Sabrina pop up, but I think we're about out of time on our session. So um, we might leave the questions uh, there, unless I'm mistaken, and they're going to tell me we have longer than I think. Michelle, I wanted to add one thing super quick. Sure. It's a statement. I don't know who to attribute it to, but I feel it really... Um, really sums up what we've been talking about, Vivian and, and Michelle, is um, progress happens at the speed of trust. I thought that was a great statement. <laughs> Excellent, and thank you to both of you for um, your really interesting and, and um, inspiring presentations. I think we have, a, we have a lot that we can do in this space and you've given us some really great, um, some great things to think about. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michelle and uh, the three panelists, uh, so Michelle included, <laughs> and it was really uh, a very interesting discussion. We will uh, take uh, all the comments and come back uh, with uh, a report. So now uh, we would like to introduce a more interactive uh, session in what does uh, the success look like. So thank you, Sabrina. So uh, this is again, as Sabrina noted, a chance for, for everyone to contribute. So next slide, Mairead. Uh, we want to go back to the questions of, you know, what does success look like? We want to start with, well, why exemplars? And as I noted earlier, the demands for ocean knowledge have been on the rise. We've heard a lot today about the various reasons why that is. I found the last session to be particularly compelling. Um, We've been talking about developing a co-design ocean observing through these exemplars because of, we think that that's the, an effective means of addressing societal relevant challenges and needs and immediately identifies a set of stakeholders and users. And we feel we have the necessary experience or expertise to address these and take them on. We're, we're ready, in other words. Um, and so we wanna uh, come back to these, to the questions about not just why exemplars, but what, what attributes of, uh, of these exemplars have, what, what does a successful one look like? So next slide. Um, let's, try to, let's try to tease out or look at a little more deeply into this. So uh, thinking about these exemplars and co-designing, again, we feel that exemplars are really gonna be well positioned or should be well positioned to help define, determine, and propose the problem, to propose solutions and evaluate the uh, solution sets and hopefully the ones that are there investable. We feel that the exemplars are also going to be building on existing experiences and identify gaps. And I, I think tomorrow's sessions will demonstrate that, that there are groups of experts already talking about this and coming to us and, and build, starting to build these communities who can take on this co-design challenge. Exemplars are, are going to drive this co-design process and going to develop, help develop the best practices. And out of that, eventually, as, as we've noted, we need to develop, develop some infrastructure, whether it's tool sets or capabilities, OSSEs, or if it's um, uh, resourcing or centers to help take these processes and help make them work for everyone's benefit. We feel that Goose and its partners are, are here to help support and provide, for example, uh, enable or provide some access to funding opportunities and help do the implementation and supporting these efforts going forward. We also feel that the co-design exemplars are going to offer um, value, visibility, and actionability. There's no doubt in our minds that the exemplars we've highlighted this week and no doubt additional exemplars are going to excite communities, excite investors, excite those who want to support this endeavor and excite the sort of rethinking and uh, of our ocean observing system as we go forward for the next decade. 
lastly, exemplar is going to help again point us to the motivation and uh, help us uh, drive towards streamlining our investments and streamlining really and thinking about our integration across all the ocean observing activities that we have in place or will have in place. So um, now we want to turn to a set of questions. So I hope you have your computers or phones ready to uh, help respond to some questions. So our first set of questions, uh, first question is um, you're thinking about the day and, and thinking about the, the discussions around the exemplars tomorrow. What in your mind, or what are the biggest challenges to develop being more robust co-design observing systems? And um, we ask you to just take your one word or a couple words, stick it in the, in the Slack channel. And we have people monitoring, so it doesn't, we're not asking for long answers, but uh, whatever you want to offer there. And um, we'll also be looking up to our um, panelists today to also chime in on some of this. Our exemplar leads for tomorrow during the breakout sessions, um, we'll also be looking to them. So I might be asking some of them uh, specifically to, to chime in. I'm not sure if they're all online, but um, we may, uh, we may just draw upon that, that expertise. And so uh, I'm going to be looking to uh, Anne and Moraine and some of our others who are looking at the Slack channel and seeing what's coming across my computers, coming across with lots of, of indications that things are happening in the, in the chat. So what, are we, what kind of answers are we getting, so Sabrina? We have uh, achieved collaboration and uh, again, constructive collaboration, collaboration with indigenous and local communities. Then uh, in, we have also integration of new observation that are cost effective and cater to specific user needs. We have funding for personal and succession, succession planning. Uh, incentive for collaboration, so uh, collaboration again. Integrating biological uh, observation for organisms larger than plankton. So we are starting with plankton, but we need to go further with the oil piece. Um, biggest challenge is to involve in a positive way the local communities that live near the sea and depend on it for the local economy. Uh, so again, uh, biggest challenge, finding time venues to bring scientists to meet non-scientists that need the information repeatedly. Making sure right holders are included. Human rights-based approach to marine conservation and ocean research leaving time for the engagement to happen. It often takes longer than expected. Focusing on variables and being platform agnostic. Identification and engagement with potential stakeholders, resource for collaboration and implementation, policies that either promote or inhibit collaboration. Funding for uh, the needed infrastructure, on-demand funding, circular flow of information between all parties. Improve a visualization process for stakeholders network building. So this, this is phase of, of collaboration also mm -hmm. with digital twins. Affordable sensors, easy access uh, to data, sustainability from funding to adaptive responsive system, sharing data, observing in an interoperable way, reducing bars to conduct uh, international science, providing best outcomes for all stakeholders, statement of requirement what question do we uh, want to answer and observe so this is the engagement with the dialogue with the end users in the exemplars uh, right policy with people participation funding capacity for developing co-design observing program in region where observation are limited identify the communalities between the individual exemplars this is also very mm. important. Realistic network design, in, 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 so including considering cost capacities and maintenance. But still, we need uh, to really assess what is the cost versus the benefit of observations. We have heard before that can be really 12 times the cost, the benefits that we, we have from observation, if not more. So this is a first set. Wow, fantastic response. <laughs> well, so thank you. Please continue to, to offer those thoughts. I, I've heard several different threads around, um, obviously, funding will be a concern, and we're hoping to address that again to our, our day four of our, our workshop, which will be an engagement with funders. 
I also heard a lot about stakeholder engagement, defining them. Um, and we heard some great examples today about how different groups are approaching them and um, uh, through uh, different scales, so a, a sort of local regional scales, but we also heard about some engagement of stakeholders at sort of global scales and the types of tools they're using, particularly for large scales models and climate. Um, now, what are some of your thoughts, Sabrina, and what you're seeing and hearing? Well, I, 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 I find that uh, there is also a lot of emphasis on translating, uh, well, the collaboration, of course. So maybe in the exemplars, we can try not only to focus the exemplar as such, but the exemplars at regional levels, having some uh, hotspots. So this will enhance mm. collaboration and dialogue with stakeholders up to the political level. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And uh, also we could uh, try to, uh, uh, there is another emphasis on translating data into usable information, but also accessible, uh, make the data more accessible for easy to use access and also a major concern is also where we we find these data because mm -hmm. they are all put around so they, we should also think into the exemplars in how we can organize this data infrastructure that is much needed yeah we've heard through our preliminary discussions around uh, making sure that data are compliant with fair and and also make as you said making them more accessible to a wider range of audiences i think we also heard today yeah. about we heard about communities who could use information, but maybe don't have access or may not know about that data. And it seems like we just need to elevate greatly yes. our efforts to make this information And, and I think that within the exemplars, there may be the hotspot focus that could maybe come out uh, in the, within each exemplars. We can also think about raising capabilities, uh, capacity building in the sense that we can try to uh, share uh, formation of uh, technicians of uh, engineers for data and collection and data access and also of course uh, uh, classical uh, students from uh, for becoming scientists. That would be very important, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it is uh, very important. Um, uh, we have uh, identification of location of ocean observation. So this is a little bit uh, uh, a gap uh, a gap analysis. So we need a gap analysis uh, versus the requirements, so societal requirements that are behind each of these exemplars. And uh, probably uh, a regional uh, focus will, uh, will enable us to access the tools to be more, more agile in, in assessing these gaps. Great. All right. Shall we Good. Shall we look at our next question? Yes, next right. question. Maybe. Thank you for that tremendous response. Please uh, continue to respond. But we have a, another question. So, Maureen, if you could go to that next question, please, uh, on the screen for us. Thank you very much. So as we think about not just the biggest challenges, but think about the discussions tomorrow, um, what are the most important steps or attributes for or elements of a successful co-design exemplar area? So tomorrow, many of you will be in breakout groups talking about one of those six important topics, or maybe you're going to go to more than one. That's okay. But thinking about what um, what you would like to see in that exemplar to achieve a successful co-design demonstration, um, what what would that what would you have to do and then how will you know if you're successful what is the that evidence is it a successful forecast is it a um is it just a provision of a more comprehensive data set or is it development of appropriate tools you know what are your thoughts on where these uh exemplars could go in terms of developing these tangible evidences of of, of progress and success and so we ask again Please uh, chime in to the to the to the Slack box and uh, tell us your thoughts there. So we have uh, again uh, people participation and value chain, participative research, benefit for society, local intended more on local community than uh, mm. general uh, general uh, uh, more global assessment. Be able to listen and observe the group and harness the information in a solution comprehensive assessment of applicable scales of in inference given sampling design, reaching out and real engagement engagement with end user local communities industries, um, 
uh, engagement of policy leaders and sponsorship from uh, government and philanthropy, identify and engage with key users to define what are the application. Engagement with stakeholders and right holders first to determine most important focus area. Design proposal of requirement report like WMO uh, RRR, so uh, rolling review for requirements. Uh, diversity, equity inclusion achieved. The, then document the requirement user have for success. It should be one of the, our key metrics. Uh, research for all. Um, Engaging with social scientists and practitioners to help sort uh, out which user to serve in, prior, in a priority way. Of course, we will need to have some priorities and uh, maybe we can try to assess those in a, in a different way as just expert. Public obtain a value from uh, the ocean information we provide and recognize the importance of our ocean observing system. Cl clearly identify stakeholders at the beginning of the process and check that they are satisfied with the outcome. So this is what is the interactive process. So we will, would like to install in these exemplars exactly with the stakeholders and end users. Engaging early again, and often with an user of many types, including decision maker, the public, rights, stakeholders. Conversation on ocean observation, further joined our core observation community, of course. Metric for success, delivery of product that translate the observation into information and tools aimed at solving the user problem. So probably we can also uh, try to assess, we have seen a C3S, so the Copernicus uh, example, how they established their success in, in, in tracking the end users of, uh, of their data. So we can try to think for the example or something like that. Deciding what is the goal, working with stakeholders, not just other scientists, and then reassessing if goal has been met. Being flexible to change, so being agile, change the design if it is not giving the outcome desired. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but because it's jumping yeah, yeah, a yeah. little bit. <laughs> so I don't know, you want to to try to, to come up with uh, some comments on that, David? I was struck by the many uh, mentions of engaging with the stakeholders and users, and I, I, I would bet that many of the exemplars will have different sets of categories of stakeholders. As we heard, some are targeting WMO-like processes, some are going to be very local in nature. We've also heard about the importance of Indigenous communities and others. Um, I was also struck that, again, the bringing in the private sector, which is a sort of a different set of actors that we haven't traditionally been engaged with. I think those are some major things I heard. Yeah, so I think uh, you're right. And uh, I, uh, the first set of examples, so we choose to have really a, a very uh, low number of examples to start is really to, to learn how to engage with these end yeah. users. And these examples are diverse enough to, to engage with different community of, stay, uh, of uh, stakeholders and end users. So, of course, uh, we should uh, interact uh, uh, all in all process, uh, BOOS should interact uh, with them in order to, to help uh, to expand the, the ideas and to exchange these ideas across exemplars too. Okay, great. All right, um, also recognize you might need to go to your next meeting. So <laughs> yeah. thank you, Sabrina. Um, okay, so lastly, we'll, we have one more question we want to, to ask and again, appreciate all the great responses so far. Um, so the third question we have is, uh, we've already mentioned that we have six exemplars uh, that will be discussed tomorrow in our breakout rooms. And we wanted to get a sense from uh, this community, this community of experts here today on what you thought some additional uh, future exemplars might be. So going beyond those that we're talking about this week, we're just trying to get a sense because we often get this question. My, you know, I, I've had this many times over the past week. So um, we encourage you to, just for us to, to have as information what people are thinking about in terms of additional exemplars that around which we could, could form some activities. So again, please drop those ideas into the into the Slack channels and that would be really great. And we'll keep that um, on, on tap and we will, uh, we will continue to look at that. So, so I, I start. Oh yeah, sure. Going. Go yeah. 
So there, there is a, a, a point on polar ecosystem. I, I would add probably also the tropical, uh, tropical, tropical ocean, ocean, as we have discussed earlier. I think it is uh, really another uh, potential mm -hmm. example. Uh, there are uh, um, couple systems. So I don't know, Tatiana is, uh, is uh, saying about couple system. Do, do you, Im I imagine you think about ocean atmosphere? I don't know, may, maybe you can precise. Deep ocean territories of life consortium at the global level, compound extremes. So this means extreme of the ocean and at atmosphere. And uh, actually, we think that the ocean is really <laughs> shaping many of these extremes we feel on the continent. Uh, deep ocean in the spirit, as I do. Uh, mesopelagic community diversity biomass, coastal habitat, mapping and change, and could be related to polar change as well. Melting ice caps and glaciers across the globe. Mm. Uh, plastic pollution tracking, monitoring mm. the ocean, nuclear mm. waste tracking and monitoring, ocean drivers of seasonal predictions, offshore renewable energy. Mm. Yeah, those are great examples. And I, I, I the one the examples that speak uh, loudest to me are the ones that are oriented towards what I what I characterize as uh, ben societal benefit areas, or where where I where I get clear who the end users are, so you know the things that link to fisheries or ocean health or forecasting for a purpose for communities. I think those that re that relate best to the public are the ones that I think resonate well with me. Yeah, so uh, they are also new uh, new pathways uh, to to undertake uh, important collaboration and co-design. Yeah, and we communities. have to know who those stakeholders are. So again, I think if we can reflect that in our discussions around these exemplars, that would always help. I think. Yeah, so there are there are um, many coming up. So okay. we we could. Uh, we could, uh, uh, of course, Slack and uh, and all uh, what is uh, written under the whiteboard will be uh, uh, recorded. So we will have all these ex example or potential examples, yeah. and we can uh, brainstorm uh, later on in, in the in the workshop and program. All right. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you all for contributing to the to those. Uh, to your your thoughts to those questions and we appreciate your engagement any concluding thoughts Sabrina before you have to go uh yeah no I would like really to encourage all the workshop uh, participants to engage already in what uh, will be the examples that uh, we have started with uh, thinking and uh, because uh, some of you have experience uh, of different type of observing system long experience uh, there are many examples that are across domains and across scales and uh, we are going uh, really in new pathways because we are going from global to local and uh, so there is a lot to, already to do in these six examples so all we have learned today will be very helpful and, uh, and an interesting discussion in the, in, we need to consolidate this discussion through these examples as a starting point so i would like to invite everyone to, to participate in the, in the discussion of day two and the breakout uh, through the, these uh, different examples. Thank you, Sabrina. I would just say it's been a fantastic uh, uh, session that we've had today. The thing that strikes me again is just thinking about the core elements of co-design. It does mean designing with a, with a purpose, with a group of stakeholders who are there at the table, helping being very active participants and determining what that observing system will be and knowing that our information system, uh, that the information that we're providing is not always just observations. It could be a model product and, 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 or just information as was brought up by several of our speakers today. So I, I think that's the thing that I, I think is really important as, as we talk about this transformation. So, and then we are all here from the, in New York in this moment because we are talking at uh, the delegates. Uh, of the law of the seas and uh, making the point why observation of the ocean are important. It's all week dedicated to that. And, uh, and so the ocean is starting to receive uh, more attention than before. And, and uh, so there is, it is the moment to do it. Yeah, agreed. All right, so again, thank you for the great participation today. Um, we have enlisted 
excellent leaders for our uh, breakout sessions tomorrow who have been working for several weeks now, uh, organizing their thoughts, organizing preliminary sessions uh, for tomorrow's breakout sessions. So tomorrow, um, yes, thank you, Maureen. So, or Andrea, thank you. Uh, we are envisioning that everyone will, will identify the exemplars of interest to them. I'll give you a schedule in just a minute on, on where, you can, where you can join and how you can join. But our questions and our charge to the breakouts tomorrow are to, again, think about who are the stakeholders that are necessary in this co-design process and how will you engage them uh, to better understand their needs. Uh, we're also asking, again, thinking about that proposal that will come and that opportunity that will come later. Think, what are the current status and, and gaps with regards to enabling this co-design activity, the co-design observing system and information system that encompasses the observations, modeling, forecasting. Um, and so thinking about that entire delivery of information, what are, those, what are the gaps that we best need to address? And then finally, thinking about our proposal and our, our what we call a, a pitch or an opportunity to advertise and solicit support for these exemplars. Um, what do you need to get to, to finishing uh, a proposal? And what are the sort of key takeaway messages that we would tell support potential supporters? Uh, why this is important? What are our prospects? Uh, what's going to be the benefit? Um, and so tomorrow that will be part of the discussions during the breakout sessions. If you're, next slide please, if you're looking for information on where, where to go tomorrow, or you're looking for some inspiring uh, discussions, here is a list of the exemplars for tomorrow's breakout sessions. Um, it was in the meeting materials. These are the various times tomorrow for the breakout sessions. They're not all at the same time because we recognize that people are working at different times and sometimes the leaders felt that uh, uh, an alternate starting time was necessary. We even have, I think, one group that's meeting or a couple groups that are meeting at two different times. So thank you for that extra effort to uh, and train and encourage participation to accommodate a number of, of, of time zones. So again, this is our schedule of tomorrow. There is no plenary meeting tomorrow. So the only meetings of, uh, that are part of the workshop are these breakout meetings tomorrow. We will reconvene on uh, two days from now, on Thursday at the same starting time, where we will hear, I don't think we have a slide for it, but we will be hearing uh, from the breakout groups, from the exemplars on their progress uh, towards the charts that we've given them that I've already indicated. We'll also be hearing some interesting talks on Thursday about uh, economic valuation of ocean observing activities. So that's a bit of a, an advertisement or a teaser for those uh, talks coming up on Thursday, which I think will be really interesting. We will also do some wrap up and next steps uh, in the co-design, observing co-design um, activity. And we'll talk about what will come after this week's workshop. So again, on behalf of uh, Sabrina and the entire organizing team, thank you all for joining uh, today's session. We look for the really exciting discussions tomorrow uh, and discussing these really important exemplar areas. And we look really, we're really excited about hearing about the progress of both those conversations and the plans you're developing uh, to help address these important needs. So we will see everyone tomorrow and then reconvene in plenary on Thursday at the same starting time as this morning. Have a great uh, Wednesday. So live from New York, uh, we're, we're finished for the day. Thank you all very much. Have a good day.